Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. One of my favorite things to do is read folklore stories in my free time. It's not often that I read them on the channel, but I think it's time that we compile some of these. So, today, I'm going to be sharing some of my favorite folklore stories. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp, and stories like yours that help keep this show going. Joining me today is my good friend Vitus22. He's a very long time friend, pretty much from the start of the swamp. He's a great narrator, and I think you guys will enjoy his voice. And if you do, I would really, really appreciate it if you would check out the link in the top of the description and subscribe to his channel. He is very close to 10,000 subscribers, and it would be super awesome if you guys would help him out with that. I do feel that he might be the most underrated narrator on the platform, but that's just my opinion. Anyways, I appreciate all your well wishes recently. I am feeling a lot better. My thumb is still broken, but feels much better than it did about a week ago. But uh, I really do appreciate all the kind messages. Thank you guys. Now, let's get into these creepy and downright strange stories that'll keep you up tonight. So, I started volunteering at a wildlife refuge recently, and one of the resident animals is awfully weird. So, like I said, I started volunteering there about a month ago. I go in on Sundays and Saturdays for a five hour shift and basically just feed the animals, change their water, give medication to the ones who need it, and then discuss miscellaneous work. This is a wildlife refuge though. So the end goal is to return as many of the animals as we can that are delivered to us by animal control back to the wild as possible. So some animals for one reason or another unfortunately can't go back to the wild because of injuries, imprinting, or what have you. These are our resident animals who are permanent stays at the refuge. On my first day, the lady who runs the place gave me a tour. It's not a big place, maybe the size of a small park, with maybe two or three dozen animals of all species and all sizes at any given time. She showed me where the raccoons are, where the possums are, where the squirrels are. There's even a one-eyed coyote there as a resident, amongst all things. But then, at the end of the showing, she brought me towards a relatively large building. It was wooden, but about the size of two cargo containers side by side, with a pretty hefty padlock and some bolts on the entrance, and what looked like a reinforced beam and walls all around. Most of the buildings that housed the refuge animals were in mild disrepair, only as well maintained as they needed to be, but this one looked like someone was taking care of it and repairing it on a weekly basis, if not more frequent. The lady explained to me that this is where they kept the resident deer, Bambi. She had laughed at the name, but then I remembered from reading in the handbook that wildlife refuges aren't even supposed to even have deer, let alone make them a resident, since they're so high maintenance and such a hassle to deal with. I asked her why we have Bambi then, and she explained. Yes, well, Bambi's sort of a... Uh... A uh, special case. It's a bit complicated as to why, but all you need to know is that you don't have to feed her or anything. I do that myself, since she's a bit much to handle at times. Right as she finished her explanation, there was a loud bang from the enclosure that Bambi was housed in. That both looked like and felt like that it had shook the foundations of the place. For a moment, I worried that the walls would collapse and an angry deer would come rushing out. But that, thankfully, didn't happen. Ah, seemed like she's energetic today. I might need some sedatives when I go in. It wasn't strange for the refuge to use sedatives, 
they were dealing with wild animals, after all. But my mind was immediately struck with the image of this slightly tubby, middle-aged lady taking down a deer with a tranquilizer rifle, which I laughed about a little to myself. I put my concerns about this deer out of my mind though, and just focused on getting trained for the job. Whenever I was near Bambi's building though, I would sometimes hear what I would assume, based on my naive experience from watching too many nature shows, was a deer call. But it was deeper, almost grumbling, much like a large predator animal would make. Plenty of the animals in the refuge made noises, some almost constantly, but the sounds Bambi's were making were quite unsettling compared to what the other animals sounded like. Again, though, I tried not to worry about it, and my first few days working at the wildlife refuge went fine. Sunday before last, though, I saw something that started to make me a bit more concerned about what was going on with Bambi. The lady who ran the place had explicitly told me that she fed Bambi after we closed up shop around 6 p.m. because the deer were nocturnal and night eaters. I knew that nocturnal deer existed, so this wasn't too worrisome for me. What was worrisome was that what I saw when I was sitting out in my car after my shift was over, texting a friend about my dinner plan. It looked like the manager was making her way over to feed Bambi, and she was carrying two things with her as she approached the enclosure. The first was a tranquilizer rifle, at which point I had small, nervous chuckle at my previous idea actually ending up being true. And the second thing was a bag full of something that looked deep red and full of liquid. What I saw in the bag was unmistakable, even from the distance I was at. It was a bag full of raw, bloody meat, enough to feed a group of 20 people at a steakhouse with two servings each, if not more. Now, I knew that some deer have been shown to eat meat under specific circumstances, so the concept of Bambi having some steak for dinner wasn't that concern to me. Instead, it was the sheer amount of raw flesh that was being brought in by the manager and the fact that it seemed to be only food that she was bringing in. I know that the deer can eat meat, but I'm fairly certain that there's no species of deer that eats only meat. They can be omnivorous, but I've never heard of a purely carnivorous deer. Worried that the manager might get mad if she knew I was watching, I ducked under the dashboard and waited for her to go in and quickly drove off for dinner with my friends, putting the image of that bag full of raw meat from my mind as I coincidentally enough had some hamburgers to eat. Now, that could have easily been the end of it, and I had just minded my own business afterwards. But, as any good, no sleeper, my curiosity is too far to be suppressed by common sense. Between the noises that no deer should make, the regular shaking and crashing coming from inside the Bambi's enclosure, and now knowing what deer's daily dinner consisted of, I had to go look. I just had to. I had been entrusted with the keys to the animal's cages and enclosures on my second week, and I quickly realized that there was one key on the ring I didn't use for anything on my daily routine. I figured that it must be to some place that wasn't being used, or maybe that had been decommissioned, or something like that, and I didn't overthink it at the time. This past Sunday, though, I had an idea one that turned out to be right. I don't know why the manager would keep a key to Bambi's enclosure on the ring that all of her volunteers use, but I wasn't about to question her oversight. I had made my way to the building once I was sure the manager would be busy for a while with some of her office work and slowly and steadily approached the entrance. I was used to Bambi's banging up against the walls whenever anyone got close, but it still startled me every time it happened. Now, more than ever, more importantly, I hoped that all the noise the deer was making wasn't alerting the manager as to what I was trying to do. Eventually, after what felt like minutes of tiptoeing to the door, I managed to reach the padlock and tried the key. 
and went in on the first try, which somehow didn't come as a surprise to me. A few bolts later, and I managed to open the front door and opened into an airlock of Bambi's enclosure. All of the other enclosures have a similar system to keep them from getting out whenever we go in to feed or clean them, so this wasn't surprising. What was surprising was just how secure the inner door of the airlock was. If the outer door felt like a bank vault, then the inner door felt like Fort Knox. There must have been four or five different locks, all of which used the same key, thankfully, and at least half a dozen different bolts. The door itself was heavily reinforced and felt like, from pushing on it, like it must have weighed quite a bit. Of course, all of these precautions made sense given the strength of Bambi, which I regularly noticed shook the building and was desperately trying to contain her. Right as I had that thought, another such banging came from just inside, along the wall. Thankfully, not on the door. Which I felt far louder than it normally was from being inside the building. I silently cursed under my breath at the ruckus Bambi was making and started to undo the inside locks. Normally, we're supposed to secure the outer door of the airlock before opening the inner door, but I wanted to keep an escape route, so to say. I didn't have any plan for Bambi breaking out entirely, but I figured out that I would cross that bridge when I came to it. Once all the locks and the bolts were undone, I very, very slowly opened the door, which was just about as heavy as I thought it would be. My heart pounding in my chest from both nerves and anticipation, this stupid deer that had been in the periphery of my mind for the past month would finally be before my eyes, and I was both excited and terrified. The moment I cracked open the entrance, though the smell hit me before I could see anything, I was vaguely aware of it while outside the building, and slightly more so while in the airlock. But once I opened the door, it slammed into me like a big truck. It was the smell of rotten meat, decaying flesh, and all of the nastiness that comes with those things. The buzzing of flies filled the air, as I had to repress the urge to vomit from the stench. Did this deer even know how to finish her dinner? I heard the buzzing of flies, but no other sound from inside. No snorting, no growling, no stamping of hooves. Nothing. On one hand, I was relieved that I wasn't promptly being charged by an angry deer. But on the other hand, I began to worry that she might be getting ready to ambush me. Did deer even know how to ambush people? As I opened the door a bit more, the first thing I noticed were the eyes. The inside of the enclosure was pretty dark. Few lights embedded the ceiling, a number of them broken being the only things that illuminated the place since it had no windows. That being said, the two deep red orbs on the deer's face looked like they were glowing embers of fire and felt like they had the ferocity to match. The second thing that I noticed was her mouth. It was stained red and what I assumed was blood. It looked as though it was continuously frothing, almost making me think of rabies but we were supposed to put down any animals with rabies, so that couldn't be what this was. The third thing that I noticed were the antlers. I knew that female reindeer could grow antlers, but this was no reindeer, not by far. In fact, given the general mass and size of the deer in question, I wasn't even sure that she was any species of deer that I knew of all. Have you ever heard of Samson, the draft horse? He was over seven feet tall and weighed a little over a ton and a half. I'm pretty sure that Bambi herself was at least a bit larger than Samson, with some extra muscle mass to boot. Everything about the deer screamed predator, from the rippling muscles to the massive hooves, and I'm fairly certain that one should never get the feeling of predator from a deer in the first place. Bambi's antlers began to scratch along the roof as it started to make its way towards me. Its legs, having enough force behind them to vertebrae, shake the ground with each step it took. 
Oh God. It was making its way towards me. I tried to shut the door as fast as I could, but in my fascination with the creature, I had ended up opening it way too far. That Bambi had enough time to charge its way over to the lodge and open it with its antlers. At this point, I was cursing all of the curiosity that I'd ever had in my life, and my veins began to flood with adrenaline as I fought for what I may know to be my life. This thing would kill me. If it got the chance, and probably would eat me like whatever meat the manager had been feeding it thus far. I quickly realized that there was no way I was going to win a contest of strength with Bambi, especially not against her antlers, and stopped trying to get the door shut. Instead, I grabbed my key ring, put a few keys through the space between my fingers, like I learned in self-defense class, and stabbed at Bambi's neck. I knew that this refuge was here to help animals stay safe and protect them from stuff like this and rehabilitate them, but quite frankly, I'd rather kill an animal that I'm supposed to be taken care of than let some gigantic mutant fuckhead deer have me for dinner. Well, all morality of it aside, it was still a pretty bad idea either way. The key stabbed as far as they could into Bambi's neck, maybe an inch at the most, but they didn't seem to do much, except make her angry. A second after my mind had time to process how bad of a decision that was, Bambi reared up on her hind legs. How she did that in a building, with such a low ceiling, I'm not so sure. She kicked forward, bashing the door open, and the only reason I survived that strike was because of the door itself. As strong as it was, it took enough of the force that I was simply knocked flat on my ass. I was fairly certain, however, that I wasn't going to stay alive for much longer, given that Bambi was now staring down at me with those crimson eyes of hers that gleamed violence and hunger with a glance of light that hit them. I assumed she was going to rear up again in order to stomp me into the ground like meat. But instead, she started to lean down. I wasn't quite sure what she was doing for a few seconds until she opened her mouth. Let me say right now, a deer are not supposed to have teeth like that. Incisors, as sharp as knives and about as long, from front to back, about as many as a shark is supposed to have, if not more, with serrated edges. I was fairly certain that Bambi could actually kill and eat a shark if she tried. Viscera and gore were stuck between those monstrous teeth of hers, and as she got closer, I nearly passed out from the smell of all the raw meat on her breath, the temperature of which was almost hot enough to scold my skin. For a moment, I said every prayer from every religion that I could remember, preparing myself for whatever afterlife I would be soon heading to. In the moment that I thought that Bambi was going to chop down on my head, though, she didn't. Instead. I heard a thwip sound come from behind me, and the deer whined, and what I presumed was some sort of pain. The sound was still as deep, and if not deeper than a lion's roar, and it retreated back inside of its enclosure. In that second, after that, I thanked my lack of caution for not locking the outside door of the airlock, as the manager was standing there with a the tranquilizer rifle I had seen with her before. The lady was angry, sure enough, and I assumed to her for a moment that she was just going to shoot me with the rifle next and throw me in there for Bambi to eat. Instead, she went to the door. She locked it as tightly as she could and helped me up. I told you to let me handle Bambi, didn't I? That she did. That she did. Between the sheer shock of the situation and my good sense not to push her any further, I didn't really ask any questions about what was up with Bambi, why we were keeping her, or exactly what kind of meat she was eating. The lady didn't fire me or anything either, and I'm still planning on going to work next weekend, but I think I'll be staying away from Bambi's enclosure from now on. I'd rather not end up as the contents of some giant flesh-eating deer's stomach, 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 stomach.
Dan. Dan. I hear my wife's voice in dreams most nights, but lately, I've been hearing it when I wake as well. My wife went missing about four years ago, but I'm firmly convinced she is dead. No one could find her, from the rangers to the police to me. No one knows what happened to her. I'm convinced something killed her in these woods. I've made my home here most of my life. My wife joined me shortly after we married. She was more than capable hunter, and so I figure whatever got her couldn't have been anything less than capable itself. I'm inclined to believe it was more or less a he or a she. The woods in Minnesota are a lonely place during the winter. My wife was out on a morning hunt shortly before she went missing. It's a strange feeling when someone you love vanishes from your life like that. It's all at once infuriating and crushingly depressing. The lack of closure, that is what hurts the most about it in my opinion. Now, I have nightmares about her. The thoughts inside my mind creating a story of some horrific end that changes every night that I dream. The worst part of it all is waking to her voice. I always hear it at the end of the dreams, and I hear it again upon waking. I know it isn't her, and I know something out there wants me to believe it is her. Sitting up, I realize Dawn is approaching. I was awoken at some point last night to the sound of screaming from the forest. I'm not suicidal enough to investigate something like that in the middle of the snowy night. Yet. Once the sun rises, I'm going to head out and check another cabin not terribly far from here. A neighbor, if you can call them that being the distance lives there. Her name is Loretta and she was there for when my wife disappeared. I'll be damned if I don't at least investigate the screams I heard. I spent the rest of the darkness cleaning my guns and prepping them by candlelight. I like a simpler life, and I don't need to have electricity or any of that. I know the forest like the back of my hand, and as soon as daylight completely breaks, I head out into the snowy forest to investigate. It's a three mile hike east before I finally arrive at my destination. You can imagine this takes quite some time normally, but twice as long in the deep snow. Upon my arrival, I began pounding on the door. Loretta, Loretta, you in there? I hear nothing. I give the door another knock, but upon hearing nothing, I announce my intention in case she just didn't hear me and kick the door in. I asked her not to shoot. It doesn't take long to get in. When I do, I fall back in shock. Th there's blood everywhere. It looks like a few shots were fired off. There is no sign of a body. Judging by the blood, however, it doesn't look good. Fuck, I think to myself, what the hell could have happened here? Examining things more closely, it seems to me she was mauled by some sort of animal. The only problem being, outside of my own forced entry, the cabin was locked and it doesn't look like anyone or anything forced their way inside. I looked even closer and saw some shredded shirt cloth with a shotgun on the floor with a deep claw mark in the stock. Judging by the bleeding, things looked even closer and worse for Loretta. Why would she be missing if whatever attacked her didn't already win the fight? I took a deep breath and looked for any sign of trail or anything. It appeared some blood led to the door, but after that, all traces ended. I figured the snow was the likely culprit for the missing trail. It snows heavily and often this time of year. It wouldn't take any time for that blood trail to be soaked or otherwise vanish. I kicked myself at the thought that I could have tried to come last night. This was soon followed by the sobering realization that I could have been killed if I had come out here. A three mile hike in the middle of a snowstorm and a forest just wasn't practical, even from someone who spent most of their life out here. Pushing any further regret from my mind, I decided to look around outside. Examining the outside of the cabin wasn't proving very worth, however, as the snow had covered everything, there were no leads. 
only a missing body lost in the bloody brawl. I've seen some strange shit around here, but who or what could have gotten into a cabin without forcing a lock and then disappearing without a trace? I'm no detective, but we all lock our doors at night. I even go a step further and built a system that allows me to put a piece of welded metal behind my already locked door, just in case. It's simple, but it's never failed me. With no leads, I look around the forest. The snow is falling more lightly than last night, but it's still snowing as I decided to head further east. Maybe I'll find something that will give me more of a clue further ahead. As I walk deeper into the forest, I pull out some homemade jerky and eat, looking around to try to find something that catches my eye. In the brush, a few feet away, I see a set of eyes. Slowly, I walk towards them, but as I get closer they disappear. Probably an animal, I think to myself, as I continue to eat and walk. I laugh as I ponder in the woods, they might be just getting to me a bit. If you live out here in solitude long enough, you'll start to hear things or see things that aren't there. Sometimes your mind will make things bigger than what they are. Shaking off any hesitation, I continue forwards, having put away the jerky I was eating. I headed in the direction of the eyes in case there was a future meal to be had. Although, I could go into town, which is many miles away I might add, I generally find it better to just hunt for my own food. That's life out here, and how we've basically sworn off society. Stepping through the brush, I don't see any animal, but I do find some curious looking tracks. Looking down, I see a track about three feet in length, and with what appears to be a single toe. Looking through the trees, I follow the tracks until I begin to notice blood again. The blood appears to grow more prevalent the further I travel until I finally push my way through some bushes. On the other side of the bushes, I freeze in place, looking at a tree. I see. What can only be Loretta? I identify her by what's left of her tattered clothing on her shredded corpse. What could have done this, I think to myself. Poor Loretta was only 25, and as kind as a soul there could be. Examining what was left of her body, it is clear that whatever did this was brutal and extremely hungry. Most importantly though, it wasn't human at all. Trying to think of what sort of animal could do this, or what even could get her out here in a manner like this must have been... I, I don't know, I'm at a loss the tracks, the body, none of it makes any sense to me. I don't have long to ponder this though, as suddenly a loud shriek comes from somewhere in the forest. I'm terrified, as it's the most inhuman and unnerving sound I've ever heard in my life. I try to mentally smack myself and regain my senses as I turn my head and back from my cabin. I'm miles away and shaking as I run. Hours later, just before dark, I arrive at my cabin. I was going to drive into town, but to my shock, my truck has been destroyed. The hood is missing and it's smoking. The tires are destroyed. It is clear something doesn't want me to leave. Terrified, I run to my cabin, locking the door behind me and barring it. I try to take a moment to calm myself and breathe, but it only ends up in me vomiting on the floor. I walk over to my bed, trying to process what is happening. I soon get up pour some whiskey into a flask and take a swig. I shut the flask, shakily, and breathe. I made sure. A swig was all I took because I wanted something to calm my nerves, not make myself unaware of my surroundings. After I calm a bit, I try to think about what could have killed Loretta, and how the hell it was going to get out of these woods safely. It is evident that whatever is out there could have probably killed me already since it somehow gotten ahead of me and disabled my only means of getting anywhere in a timely manner. <sighs> Loretta was torn to shreds. Then it hits me, a despair at the thought of the same thing that killed Loretta could kill my wife. I tried not to think further on this as I refocused my mind on what I should do next. I kept my gun close lit a fire in the fireplace and sat there shaking till I finally drifted off. 
another nightmare. This one of my wife being torn to shreds. I feel hopeless as I watch her being torn to shreds, screaming in agony. Then like that, I hear her voice. She's screaming for me to help, but I can do nothing. I awake to the same voice somewhere outside. I regain my wits long enough to realize where I am. There's no way in hell I'm going to answer that call. But at the same time, I feel my soul being crushed at the sound of her voice. Is that what this thing wants? Is it trying to torment me? I cry myself to sleep again, and upon waking, I realize it's daytime again. I debate going outside, but upon opening the door I notice there is a blizzard going. Snow and ice, the likes of which I've never seen before, are pouring in droves as the wind screams at me. I force the door shut again, relocking and borrowing it, and sitting down and making breakfast. It's clear I'm not going anywhere today, I think to myself. I think on things and try to get some more sleep. For the remainder of the day, I just try to shut my eyes, but every time I do, I hear my wife scream. I ultimately wind up drinking myself to sleep. When I wake up, it is night and the storm appears to have died down a bit. I am about to get up when I see the knob on the door turning. To my shock, the door is unlocked. D did I do that? No, there, there's no way, I think to myself. If I hadn't also created the bar lock behind that, whatever's out there would have been in here by now. The thought hits me with dread as I rush over and relock the door. I hear a ferocious pounding on the door, a violent banging that lasts three or more knocks, before everything just falls quiet again. I'm trapped, alone, and with no way to contact anyone. We don't exactly have cell phones or towers out here, this deep into the woods. Thinking on that, however, someone laugh. Perhaps I should have embraced some things about society, I think. If I survive this, I will for sure, I think to myself again. Yes, if I survive, I laughed aloud. As I laugh, I realize that a bit of insanity seems to be taking hold of my mind. No. I need to stop drinking and keep my wits about me. I start up another fire and do some cooking. Deer meat never tasted so good. Food itself never tasted so good. Being alive is something I never thought I took for granted. And so now, as I'm eating, however, the delicious smell of the meat I've cooked quickly disappears as something far more nauseating catches my nose. I, I smell decay and rotting meat that is so powerful I feel dizzy. Dan. Help me, Dan. My wife's voice seems to sing from outside, almost as though the wind itself were speaking in her voice. I feel dizzy from the smell and sick from both the smell and the depressing sound of my wife's voice. Leave me the fuck alone. Why do you torment me? There is silence for a moment as I reach for my gun and pray. Then I'm shaking at the sound of glass shattering and a thud of Loretta's body now laying next to me. Terrified, I fire off a few shots into the night, but this is only met by the terror-inducing shriek and then the storm outside picking up again. My fire dies and I sit for hours shaking, cold and terrified, with my gun aimed at the window. The rest of the night is just snow falling. Nothing tormenting me. No shrieks, howls, or voices from my wife. As daylight approaches, I realize I haven't blinked for what seems like hours. I spend much of the day barricading the area with the broken window and fortifying any areas of the cabin. It is soon after this that I drag Loretta's body out and bury it. I figure I could tell the police everything if I survive, but then again, I probably won't because it is doubtful that they'd believe a word I had to say. It isn't long after burying Loretta that I realize the sun is setting and I haven't eaten. So I head inside, locking and barring my door, and adding a few other reinforcements on the door, and two extra ways to bar it. I didn't want to let anything through the door. Cooking up a meal, it didn't take long before the stench of decay reached my nose again. I knew what it was at this point. It was the smell of the thing that taunted me. It was waiting outside as it did. I sat in here, trying to eat through the stench and cowering like a baby. 
The truth is, I wanted to go out and attack it. But I did not see it yet. I did not know what I was getting into. Judging by what it did to Loretta, and some of the things I'd seen thus far, it was clear a direct approach wouldn't be wise till I knew more about it. Two things were clear about this. It was intelligent, and it was vicious. Struggling to stomach the rest of my meal, I finished it and eventually collapsed to sleep at an unknown time of the night. Waking up the next day, I realized quickly the storm was raging stronger than ever before. Something didn't seem right about that, though. It was the dead of winter, and it snowed quite a bit, but the way the storm raged, it was as though something was controlling it. I tried not to think about it and ate some more. I was trying to ration what I had. I was beginning to see my food stock dwindling. A thought crossed my mind that perhaps the thing was purposely keeping me from leaving. Was it trying to starve me to death? I laughed for a moment, but the laughing ceased when I heard another banging at the door. Leaping up, I headed for the door slowly, gun in hand. Looking through the peephole, however, I saw nothing. Did I actually hear that sound? I had to, I thought. It was way too loud, right? I was growing exhausted and tired from the psychological torment I had been experiencing. Thoughts ran through my head about possibly making a suicidal run for it. They were immediately shot down by the ever dwindling logical rational inside my head that reminded me that suicide would not be a good answer. I needed to keep my wits about me. If I needed to go out, I needed to do only in the most desperate of situations. Day blood into night, and night blood into day. Eventually, I began to lose all sense of time. Every noise made me jumpy, and every sound made me shake. I was beginning to lose my mind in such a way that I was beginning to lose food. I began equating the loss of food with the loss of sanity. Some nights were quiet, others were much louder. The storm raged on, and it was becoming apparent that it wasn't a natural storm. Some nights, I'd hear slow clawing at the doorway, or shrieks from the forest. I'd consistently hear my wife's voice asking for help, at least once every night. I know the thing had to know I knew better. I believe it did know I knew better, and I do think it knew that I knew it wasn't my wife, and yet it continued to do so. No doubt a psychological weapon being used against me to wear me down that much more mentally. When daylight comes, I find myself going out only long enough to remove snow from around my cabin, so it's not buried alive. It's extremely cold and I'm half delirious as I'm almost out of food now. I thought I heard a voice, but that'd be crazy, right? Finishing shoveling, I shut, lock and bar the door again. I take more, no more than two steps before hearing a knock again. Looking through the peephole, I see nothing. Stepping away, I hear a knocking again. I hear a voice, and it sounds like a man, but I'm, I'm not sure. Opening the door, I see nothing but snow. There is no one there, and I find myself partially wanting to tear my hair out from the grief I feel inside. The desperation is making me grow uneasy, and I'm beginning to see things that aren't there. Hours later, night sets in. The story picks up again. I find myself nibbling on the last of the food as I hear my wife's voice begging for help again. She's crying and I'm also crying. I'm not sure what is happening anymore. I'm becoming less and less able to decipher reality from insanity. I have noticed that harassing noises are becoming less frequent. The next day or two are completely quiet. I'm too weak to make it anywhere at this point and I'm starving. Every single time I stand I feel sick and dizzy. My legs shake and I'm weary. Is this it? Is this the end? A pounding rings out at the door, and I slowly walk towards the door. I look at the peephole to my shock and horror. I see an emaciated ribcage. But, but, but inside, inside is what looks like my wife's face. No, 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 that, 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 that's fucking impossible. I collapse to the floor before long. I feel the world spinning. Things grow dark, and in what feels like the blink of an eye, I feel myself laying there, listening to a noise outside. 
Just come in and kill me. I think. Just finish me the fuck off. Please, just do it. I continue to think. I feel the most desperate I've ever felt in my life, and before I know it, I'm contemplating the thought of going out into the woods and walking till I meet nor I collapse and freeze to death. Yes, this seems like the way. Just end it all. Unbarring the door, unlocking it, and delirious. I open the door, and to my shock, I see the body of this beast before me. It is huge, emaciated, and smells like death. It has a deer skull for a head, large eyes, and is dripping with fresh blood. In shock at the sight of the creature, I pull out my gun, threatening to fire. I guess I care more about my life than I realize, I, I think. It was mostly a reaction when I fired, but upon firing was the world seemed to snap to reality. Was I sleeping? Was I dreaming? And then, the reality of my situation unfolded before my eyes, standing before me, bleeding, a spray of holes in his chest was a man. I believe he was trying to ask why as he collapsed to the floor before me and panicked and desperate. I dragged him inside, locking the door and barring it again. No, 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 no. This isn't fucking happening. This isn't happening. What, what was this even? Had I just killed a man mid-sleep? Was I that hungry, terrified, and mad at this point? No. I thought to myself, this, this couldn't be real. This couldn't be happening. The thought crossed my mind for a moment that I would need to hide the body in case anyone came looking for the man. This thought lasted a moment before another thought crossed my mind. A much darker thought across my mind, something so sick and disgusting that I hesitated at first. I found myself moving into a corner away from the body now as I thought. I was out of food, I was running out of time, and I needed to eat. A war had ignited in my head. My mind was debating on what to do. My stomach and body told me exactly what I needed to do in order to survive. My mind, or what was left of it, however, said something different. If I ate some of this man, even just a little, it might be what I needed to survive. Given enough time though, with proper storage and handling, I could regain my strength. Yes, I could live. Another voice inside me was telling me no, it wasn't right. But my body and some other part of my mind was rationalizing it at all. You're in a desperate situation, you need to eat to survive. If you regain your strength, Perhaps you can get out of this place. I'm sure the police would understand, right? I felt the nose disappearing from my mind and the yes seemed far more appealing to most of my mind and all of my body. Slowly forcing myself up, I found myself with some tools in my hand, a saw and some other cutlery needed. The remainder of my night was filled with the sound of my wife asking for help, the sight of me cutting this innocent man's body up. I needed to survive. I thought with a gleeful smile as I cut into the man's meat and prepped him. That's what this was all about. It was survival. Yes, survival. Much of the rest of the night was a blur of blood, cleaning, cutting, and storing. We were just animals after all. Eating another human is just eating an intelligent animal. If it's for survival purposes, it's okay, I told myself, over and over again. Eventually, I'd finish up all the prep storage and cooked the part of the human it was part of his leg and i tried not to think about it as i bit into the char of meat of the dead man to my surprise i liked it i found it delicious i didn't debate if that was because it actually tasted great or i was just happy to eat looking in the cabinet i pulled out some seasoning and found it made it much more delicious a little hot sauce never hurt any meat either. I felt my stomach thanking me as I bit into the char of meat. I didn't eat much as I hadn't eaten in a bit and didn't want to vomit my meal up by overindulging. I stored the rest and rested. I heard the snow, I heard the cries, and none of it mattered for a moment as I passed out. In my dreams I saw my wife in those dreams. I saw her die. The difference this time being I saw from the monster's perspective. It was the strangest thing, I thought to myself. I swear I could taste my wife as the monster fed upon her. 
The dream seemed not to have an end. I saw it again and again. I could no longer decipher the difference between the monster and myself. I hadn't eaten my wife in reality, obviously, but I had eaten someone to survive. In some ways, I immediately felt sorry for this creature as it fed. No matter how much it ate, it only grew hungrier. I awoke from the nightmare, angry and insatiably hungry. I immediately pulled out more meat and cooked it, before tearing into it. I no longer knew if it was day or night. I didn't hear banging, nor did I hear shrieks of the voice of my wife. I needed to eat. This is all that mattered as I felt hot and hungry. I had eaten, but upon finishing the food, hunger consumed me again. I cooked and ate some more. Eventually, I grew tired and passed out from all the food I consumed. I found myself hungry in what felt like another dream. I saw myself through the eyes of the creature, eating viciously. What little sanity I had left was vanishing from within. I wanted to taste the flesh of more humans. Yes, I thought more humans will sate my hunger pains. I probably need to hunt some more if I hope to live. I awoke to find I was holding pieces of raw meat from the man I'd murdered. Cold chunks of meat were between my teeth and I gashed away. So good, I thought. I'm going to need to hunt more, yes. I unbarred the door and unlocked it, and was surprised to find a wall of snow and ice upon opening it. I tried breaking through some of it, but nothing worked. How long had I been here, I thought. The reality of the fact is I was trapped and was stuck. I couldn't break through and I think I might have lost my mind more because of it. The reality of the fact that I was trapped in was setting in, but it shoved out of my mind by the need to eat again. I didn't wait to cook, no. That took way too long. I lost all track of time and I don't know how long I fed, but eventually I ran out of meat. There was no longer a fire going. I couldn't make another as the snow had covered the chimney and imploded in. I was cold alone and worst of all, I was starving. I felt desperation setting in as hours seemed like seconds to me, and seconds seemed like hours to my hunger. I looked at my own arm and thought to myself, I could lose that, yeah, that'd be okay. Anything to feed again, I thought to myself. I thought about cutting off my arm, but instead? I decided not why not waste the time and cook my own flesh. I'll admit it hurt at first. Tasting my own blood was somewhat pleasant though, as I also tasted the raw meat of my own flesh. I ignored the hair and the flesh and worked my way slowly to what I believe was the bone. At one point, before feeling weak, probably from blood loss, the world was cold. Now, it was pleasant though, and soon I felt everything going black. I drifted off into a cold abyss, dreaming only of my next feast, as I did. Some time later. Shocking news today as a park ranger and police officer are found dead. Police and park authorities were on the lookout for a man reported missing not long ago, when they were two of the members that were sent out from the organization. They were both found dead with their faces partially ripped off. Local authorities following up on things when the officer hadn't been heard from shortly after reporting, he was about to investigate a cavity found out in the forest. It was then the two bodies were found, and upon further search, a third body was also found. A body belonging to Loretta Kingston was found buried in the front of the property. The owner of the property, Danielle Slag, is currently missing. Police and park authorities ask anyone with information on his whereabouts to please report the information to the local authorities immediately. Immediately. I consider myself to be an avid kayaker. I love spending time out on the water where it's quiet, peaceful, and relaxing. There's nothing like spending your day out on blue-green waters, soaking up the sun, without a care in the world. Sadly, up here in North Dakota, there aren't very many options for open water recreation. Typically, people either head towards the Missouri River, or to one of the more popular lakes in the state. 
Most places are packed with people, since there isn't a lot to choose from. Now, if you're a passionate kayaker like I am, you'll know where the quiet spots are at. There are a few hidden gems throughout the state that not many people know about. And because I don't want anyone ever going there, I'm going to call my ex-favorite spot Emerald Lake, instead of its actual name. I used to call it a hidden gem for a reason. This lake is gorgeous. Its water is unbelievably murky, which sounds the opposite of gorgeous, but it gives off this pretty emerald green color, and it perfectly reflects the sky and surrounding trees. The lake is surrounded by woods. It may not be exciting to you, but in North Dakota, you're lucky to see any trees at all. If you do, they are most likely planted by someone. These trees crown the edge of the lake, giving it a cozy feeling. You really feel like it's just you and the lake. Emerald is maybe a thousand feet wide and about three miles long. Upon first glance, the lake looks to be nothing more than a pond. But if you get towards the back, you'll find a hidden bend that takes you further along, winding in and out of tree-studded hills. In order to get to the lake, you need to travel way back into the countryside on a maze of gravel roads, perfect for keeping this place secret. On one of my days off earlier this summer, I decided to take a kayaking trip out to my precious lake. I asked my best friend to come along with me, because I knew that we'd be the only ones there. During the weekends, you might run into one or two other people, but since I have days off during the work week, I knew we'd be out on our lonesome. Perfect for catching up on gossip with your bestie. We loaded our things and set out for a fun day. We arrived at the lake at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and, as expected, there wasn't another soul in sight. Since there's only one way into the lake, and no other vehicles, we were in the clear. You'd need to trespass onto private state land and chop down a few trees to get onto the lake in any other way. I drove down to the water's edge, and we both hopped out to unload our things. I crawled into the bed of my truck to unstrap the kayaks and prepared the paddles. I started to shift the kayaks so that I could get them out more easily. We quickly set up our kayaks and I parked my truck away from the water, in the rare case that someone else came along to enjoy the lake. Right before we launched, my friend stopped what she was doing and turned to face me with a quizzical expression lining her face. Did you say something? My friend questioned. After a few moments of me giving her one of those are you nuts type of looks, she resumed. I swear, I just heard someone. I mean, it sounds like a guy, but obviously you're not a man, so it confused me. I laughed and told her that she was hearing things. She grinned and shrugged it off. So we set off on our journey, enjoying each other's company while discussing the good old days of playing Skyrim for hours on end. We laughed at inside jokes, had a few snacks, drank a few brews, and discussed trivial things. We listened to the birds chirp, watched swallows dive at the bugs around us, and giggled at some very vocal ducks who didn't like being disturbed. At one point, I had paddled over a couple of millards to try and snap a pic. It's pretty difficult to photograph grumpy waterfowl. Satisfied by what I had captured, I caught up with my friend who had floated ahead. Did you hear that weird cow? She asked when I caught up to her. I replied I hadn't heard anything but a couple of angry ducks. Oh, she looked a bit confused. I swear I actually heard something this time. It sounded like a really low, almost gravelly moo. It almost sounded like the thing was in pain. I don't know how else to explain it, other than the fact that the sound unnerved me. I gave her a puzzled look. I don't think there are any cattle in this area. I paused for a bit. Maybe one member of the herd wandered off from somewhere nearby and got hurt, but I think the nearest area would be Price's farm about 25 miles back. We both sat silent and decided to continue on. Neither of us thought much else about it. About an hour into the trip, we reached the end of the lake, or at least what most people assume is the end. We came upon the first of many bends. Knowing that we wouldn't be able to tell if anyone else arrived in the area, which was fine. 
I glanced over to a cluster of pretty aspen trees and saw a large hawk of some sort sitting at the top of one. Sparting a photo op, I turned to my friend and asked if she wanted to paddle to the other side of the area we were in to check out the lake. Being a less experienced kayaker, she shook her head and told me to head over there. She and I both knew that it would take twice as long if she joined me. I wouldn't have minded, but she didn't want to put in all the extra time and effort. I suggested she just kept heading straight while I checked out the hawk, and I would just meet up with her shortly. She agreed. I began to paddle over to the lovely aspens and the majestic hawk, excited about the neat pictures I'd be getting. The closer I got, the more I began to notice the dead trees. It saddened me to see the trees I always loved, dead and decaying. The situation was sort of odd, though. Why would this entire grove of aspens be dying off? There hadn't been any flooding in several years, and we weren't in a drought currently, so why were they dying? I neared the tree with the hawk in it, cautiously, and before I could snap a pick, the beautiful bird soundlessly took flight and disappeared into the woods. Now by myself, I began to feel this creeping sensation. My skin began to crawl as if tiny little fingers were tapping each inch of my body. My hair stood up on my arms, and I got that empty feeling in your stomach when you know you're completely alone. It dawned on me that I hadn't spotted anything else in a while. No swallows swooping in and out. No irritated ducks. Not even an occasional chirp of a songbird. Nothing. It was dead silent at Emerald Lake. Even for an area known for its peace and quiet. This moment was too dead. Due to missing a nice picture and being thoroughly chilled to the core, I switched directions and decided to head for my friend. Out of the corner of my eye, I could have sworn I'd seen a white aspen move. But it's idiotic. Trees don't move. My brain was just trying to scare me. I ignored it and began to paddle to my friend. I could still see her on the other side of the water and up a bit further, but she wasn't moving. She was completely stuck still, not moving at all. Her face was turned from me and she was looking at something in the trees, but I couldn't tell what it was. Fearing the worst, I started to power paddle to where she was. It would only take me a few minutes to get to her. Once I was about 10 feet from her, she must have heard me splashing the paddle in the water and turned to me. Her face was white as a sheet and her eyes showed signs of distress. She waved me over without a word and my eyes followed the direction she was looking. I saw what she'd been staring at. Among another set of crowded dead trees was a dirty, cream-colored tent. Now I know what you must be thinking. So what? It's a lake. People like to camp next to lakes all the time. I must remind you, the areas surrounding the lake are technically not open to the public. Only the lake was. You'd have to hike through miles of private land to get here. The tent was ominously perched right on the edge of the water, where it threatened to be consumed by the lake. It seemed abandoned. No one was around, and the site looked like someone had left and not bothered to come back. Bits of trash and miscellaneous camping supplies littered the area surrounding the tent. The little one-man tent was covered in stains, with one side completely split open. I was too bothered by the tent to get any closer to it. Someone had left in a hurry. Chills were running up and down my spine at that point. My friend turned back to me and asked, I thought you said you weren't really supposed to be on the land surrounding the lake. You're not, and I reinforced that point with her. I gave her a hesitant shrug and suggested that perhaps whomever it was just didn't realize that you weren't allowed to camp out here. Of course, I didn't really believe that. I worked at a state park for a while, and you get all sorts of people. The ones who break the rules usually know that they're doing so. A lot of vagrants tend to camp out places where no one else is around, even if it's not allowed. Maybe whoever was out here knew they weren't supposed to be here, and got chased off by game and fish or something. They left in a hurry and forgot their tent, she suggested. Maybe. I had mumbled back to her. 
I couldn't help but wonder why Game and Fish, or any other authority for that matter, would let a tent just sit out in the open and wither away. I changed the subject. So, do you want to keep going? Or should we head back to shore and find some place to eat? A look of relief passed over my friend's face. I'm starving. Let's head back. I nodded in agreement. We both quickly switched directions and began to paddle away from the lone tent. We didn't get very far before finally realizing that my friend hadn't been hearing things this whole trip. It's just like she had described to me, although I didn't really understand what she had meant until now. It started off as this weird gurgling sound and grew into this weird rumbling groan. I don't know what to call it. I see why she said it sounded like a moo. Whatever I was making the sound was animalistic. It was a low pitch coming from the trees only about 20 feet away or so. Whatever it was, it did sound like it was in pain. But what sort of creature can make a sound like that? My throat was choking on my breath and my rapid heartbeat. I couldn't swallow down my fear of the sound. I knew that whatever was making the noise had to have been just to the right of us. Despite what my brain was screaming at me, I decided to turn my head and search for whatever was making the noise. I wish I hadn't. Peeking around one of the dying aspens was a creature with the palest skin I've ever seen. The thing was so white, it seemed to be able to use the white bark of the aspens to blend in. It was sort of hunched over, with only part of its body visible behind the tree. The creature was human-like in limbs, I suppose. It had two legs and arms, but it was skin and bone, hairless from what I could tell. A long, ovular face peered out at us. No eyes, no mouth, just horrifying indentions where they should have been. Imagine the famous The Scream painting, but instead of a screaming mouth, there was just an elongated divot. My eyes began to water. I had been staring at this thing for God knows how long. I heard my friend whimper my name. She saw it too. Without moving, I squeaked at her to paddle as quickly as possible back to shore. My arms burned with the intensity that we were moving, but we couldn't stop. Not with the rustling coming from the trees that was keeping up with us. We were only about a hundred feet from shore, and the trees were beginning to thin out to almost nothing where the boat landing was. A little ways behind me, I heard a big splash. There was only one thing that could have made that. Our carp aren't that big. Faster! I screamed at my frightened friend. We were already paddling our hardest, but I didn't know if this thing could swim well or not. We finally got to shore, and the two of us practically dove out of our kayaks. I have to get the truck! I don't know why I was yelling when she was right there, but the adrenaline and fear were getting to me. I sprinted to the truck, fumbling around in my bag for the keys. When I finally found them, they slipped through my fingers and clattered out on the ground, just like one of those damn fools you see in horror movies. I hurriedly snatched them back up and flung myself into the truck. Rocks went flying as I hauled ass over to my friend in the kayaks. She was shaking. Any sign of it? I hollered. She shook her head. I haven't seen anything. I don't know whether I should have been relieved or not. Hurry and throw the kayaks into the back. Don't worry about strapping anything down. She did as I said, and together we lifted and tossed both kayaks and their paddles into the bed of the truck. I nearly slipped on the gravel as I ran to get into the driver's seat. I heard it again. I looked behind me to see its head breaching the water. Its empty sockets just staring at me. It was only about 15 feet from the shore. I ripped open the driver's door, and before both of our doors slammed shut, we were driving away. I didn't dare stop to check if we'd had everything, but I swear that when I glanced in the rearview mirror, I saw something white standing on the shoreline where we had been moments before. It's only been a week since our time at Emerald Lake, and I still have no idea what we saw that day. That day.
I'd like to preface this by saying, I know a lot of people might think this is fake, and this statement is me trying to trick you, because this really happened, and I really don't know where else to go. On this computer, I'll explain later, all the normal stuff is blocked, Facebook, email, etc. So I tried every single site imaginable, leading me here. I think this is a good place for it, and I'm not in any immediate danger, so I think it's okay to write this story out in completion. So let's do introductions. My name is Ty. It's not short for anything. Not Tyler or Tyrone, just Ty. Nice to meet you. I live in the southeast of Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia, but closer to Bucks County. Living in more of a rural area, I've always been fascinated with the woods and nature in general. One thing I've really been interested with is survival. Like living on your own, no commodities or luxuries of modern life, fending for yourself. Reading up online about this, I found this program called Outward Bound. I don't know if it operates in other areas, but the Outward Bound groups in my area go out into the wilderness as a group of about five boys. They camp together and learn skills for about five days. Then all the boys go on what's called a solo, where we camp alone, about a mile apart from each other for three days. Obviously, since it's the 21st century, we are given walkie-talkies and a map of other campers in case there's an emergency. Even if that doesn't work, we're basically in screaming distance from one another and the camp leader makes regular rounds around the perimeter of our campsites. It's supposed to be fail-safe, no liabilities. But, something happened. Let me first give you a rundown of our group. There was me, my friend Caleb, his friend Marco, and two brothers named Brian and David. Those two I didn't know that well. Our leader Nick was also with us. Nick was relatively new. This was only his second expedition. The first five days went without a problem. It was just normal camping. On the last day we were together as a group, that's when it started. We were all in our makeshift tents, Nick in his bigger and more advanced canopy farther away, and we heard a rustling in the leaves. Big deal, right? That's what we thought too. Brian woke up first. He was the most skittish of the group. I assume he only went because his brother was going. And then he woke up his brother. Them talking woke the rest of us up, and then Brian told us what was up. Obviously, we laughed at him and thought that he was just messing around or being scared. And then, we heard it. The majority of us being people accustomed to the woods and its noises brushed it off. Even after what I've witnessed, I still think it was just a rabbit. I guess we all had trouble going back to sleep after that. So partly to pass the time, and partly to scare Brian, we told horror stories. I don't remember the specifics. I guess I'm just too rattled. But I remember the outline of one that Marco told, mostly because of how it affected what happened later on. It was about a boy who went to wander the forest. One day while walking, he heard a scream coming from the further end of the forest. Coming closer to it, he saw nothing. He finally went to the exact spot the noise seemed to be coming from. He found nothing. Turning back confused and a little creeped out, he saw a wolf. Going up to pet the wolf, I don't know why he would, but a teenager made up this story so whatever, it suddenly bit him and started screaming. The boy then transformed into a wolf much like that one, and was doomed to lure people into his clutches for the rest of his days. Very bad story if you ask me. After he finished telling it, Marco seemed to scream trying to scare Brian, but at that point we were all just annoyed. After those five days, I was really excited because my most favorite part was here, the solo. We all went out alone, ready to face the woods. The camps were aligned in a straight row from east to west, with each camp being a mile apart and Nick being in the center. From east to west it went, me, Marco, Brian, Nick, Caleb, and David. The first day was one of the best days of my life, despite what happened that night and morning. I caught a rabbit, cooked it, ate it. I went fishing, climbed a tree, 
and bathed and drank from a river. I was a real woodsman. Then, it all went to shit. I don't know when the killing started, or if anybody was even killed, but for me, it started that night around 1 in the morning, if I was looking at the moon right. I went out to take a piss in the stream, when I saw a rabbit wounded on the ground. I thought I could save the trouble of getting my next meal, so I took up my knife and walked ever so slowly over to it. Knife in hand, I creeped over it until I could hear it breathing and plunged my knife down, then felt on my lower leg. The rabbit, as injured as it looked, fucking got away before I slashed it. Luckily for me, I didn't stab myself directly in the leg. I just cut it on the side. There wasn't too much blood, but it was hard to walk. I kind of semi-crawled back to the campsite and radioed Nick. No response. Shit. I had disinfect it with me. I'm not an animal, and the cut wasn't deep, so I knew I wouldn't die or anything. It didn't look like it needed stitches either, so I decided just to wait until morning. I assumed Nick was probably just asleep. I didn't bother radioing the other guys. They couldn't help me. I decided to go to sleep, so I turned my walkie off, another dumbass horror movie on my part, as I tried drifting to sleep. I was awakened by a scream, and I instantly recognized it. It was Marco, and guys, I know you'll be angry and annoyed when I tell you what I did when I heard that scream. I, I did nothing, but let me explain. Maybe it was my sleepiness or my wound, but I did not think it was a real scream. I thought that since Marco's tent was right near Brian's and that he was trying to scare Brian or something. It was a shitty move, I know, but I couldn't have helped him anyway. I was in no condition to run a mile to go get him. And neither was Brian, because Brian was either scared or Brian was dead. I really don't know at this point. About an hour later, I was still awake. I tried to play it off before, but the pain in my leg was unbearable. The wound was screaming, and I I, I just ugh, I couldn't I just couldn't deal with it. It was hell. I knew I wasn't going to die or anything, but I couldn't stand the pain at this point. Again, maybe it was the sleep deprivation or the pain, but I decided to go to Nick's camp. I knew he had painkillers in case of an emergency. Earlier, I had gathered sticks to make a fire, which I didn't make, and I grabbed the biggest one and used it as a makeshift crutch. I specifically went around Marco and Brian's campsite because I didn't want to wake them, and I had a pretty good idea of where I was. I heard the average noises in the woods, leaves crunching, wind blowing but nothing scared me. I needed those painkillers. I kind of tuned out in the middle of my walk. It's mostly a blur now. I remember it was long and I remember it was painful, but I especially remember getting to Nick's cabin and I remember his body. The funny thing is, I saw the painkillers first. I think I was dully aware that there was no sound in the cabin when Nick snores like a bear. But I guess in my delirium, I didn't notice or care. I gulped down the pills, and even though it didn't take effect right away, I felt better. Then, I noticed the steady silence that washed over me, and before I saw him, I knew he was dead. His body, it wasn't something any animal could do. I don't think it's something any human could do either, not without heavy machinery. In fact, there wasn't really even a full body there. He was torn to shreds. There was a pool of blood and a pile of mushed up meat. Like if you've ever had made meatloaf, he looked like the meatloaf mix with the milk, eggs, and raw meat all mixed together by hand. He looked like human jello. Not screaming, not even feeling that panicked, I just stared at his body for a few minutes. Then I realized I needed to get the fuck out of there. I wasn't close to Nick. There was no time for mourning. I wasn't really close to any of these people. The closest thing I had to a friend was Caleb, and we only met in the training program. I'm a survivalist, so that's what I did. I survived. Call me an asshole, but I needed to get out of there. Quickly thinking, I took Nick's radio, flicked it on, 
I heard David's voice screaming for, Please help, oh god, please help, it's coming, it's coming, please help, holy shit, please no! I flipped it on to a different channel while scouring the woods. If it hit Marco and it's on to David, it's moving west, I thought. I immediately flicked on to an emergency frequency and told them where I am. I moved east, that's all I remember. Like my trip to Nyx, it's all a blur. Everything is. First, I was heading east. Then I was in a police cruiser. And then I told them what happened. Not holding back, but I should have. They told me they would contact my parents, and that I should wait in his office, where I'm sitting at now. A few minutes before I started writing all this down, about six men in suits came in here asking for me. I overheard them talking to the sheriff about me. They're trying to take me. They said how this matter was a matter of national security. I don't know if I'm getting out of here or not. The painkillers are wearing off and man, it'd be nice to have one right now. I guess that's the end. Do what you want with this story. Brush it off as a nice little horror story and go about your life if you want. I'm real. I hope at least I'm remembered. I guess now is goodbye. Sorry, I, I don't have all the answers. Hi. For those of you who read my last post, this is a partial explanation. At least, what I've found so far. So, I'm back home now. But I, I don't have all the answers. As some of you suggested, I just played stupid for a lot of the questions they asked me. I didn't reveal what I didn't think was human. I just said I heard screaming and thought I saw a body. They asked me if I smelled anything weird. I said no. I just thought it was odd that they asked me that, so I put that in there. The men in suits that were there either are running this behind the scenes or were sent away, because I haven't seen them since. The police wouldn't tell me anything, but I figured out some information. So, from what I know so far, there is some kind of monster or alien or serial killer of high priority that attacked my campsite. I know it's high priority from the men in the suits. I saw them flash their FBI badges. I assume it's not a serial killer, because I don't know how we could have mashed up Nick's. I still don't know if that was Nick, but I still assume it was his body like that without some kind of machine that I would have definitely heard. I don't think a normal animal could have done that, so it must have been something supernatural. I don't really believe in that stuff, but I think something had to have done this. I never actually saw the thing, and I kind of want to now. I assume that it's good at keeping quiet, because I heard no noises that weren't human. They kept me in that office for a good two hours, and luckily, I deleted the browsing history after I wrote that story, because they came in there and unplugged it and asked me, did you go on this? And I obviously said no. I asked one of them if there was a police report I could read, and she dismissed me immediately. The police called my parents, and they took me home. But before they could, they had a long talk with them that I couldn't overhear. When we got home, my parents told me that we couldn't talk about it to anybody and try to forget the whole thing. I asked if I could see any of the boys in my group. They said no, I'm not allowed to. I don't really know what's happening. Whenever I ask my parents about anything, they just say, I know it's hard, but we're not talking about this. After that, they wouldn't even respond if I would ask them. I feel like the whole world is crazy. I checked out all the news sites about this and came up with nothing. Nobody seems to know about it. I was contemplating contacting the local news, but I thought it would make things worse, and obviously I'm not allowed to tell anybody. From now, I guess, I'll just try to go about my normal life. But it's gonna be hard. I'm thinking about going back into the woods to investigate and even went up to it, but there was police tape surrounding the entire perimeter of that area. I didn't do it, but I'm wondering now if I should have gone under and seen the site. I don't expect they'll keep the police tape up long, really. That will cause suspicion. 
My leg is doing better. I'm going to the doctor tomorrow. My mom told me if the doctor asked what caused the wound, I should say I was cutting the garden and accidentally cut myself. I tried to call the Outward Bound people, but they said they had no record of my camp group or of anything of Nick in their database. So I don't really know what to do now. I essentially have no proof of what happened besides my word. I can't even find any of the application papers to join Outward Bound. I don't even have any of the boys' phone numbers or Nick's, how I don't even know any of their last names. I really don't think I could prove any of it, no matter how much digging I do. I feel guilty that I left them all behind. But with my injury, I might have gotten killed too. And one death is better than two, I guess. Honestly, I don't even know if any of them are dead. This is all very confusing, and I don't know whether I should just keep my head down and forget about it, or if I should expose this cover-up. I think the people have a right to know what's happening, and I think I especially have a right to know, since I was involved. What scares me the most is whatever is going on in this forest. If this some kind of monster, I'm a little skeptical on that, how are they going to capture it? Am I safe with my house being right on the edge of the woods? Does it somehow have my scent or whatever? Even though I hate that somebody is trying to cover this up, I really hope they succeeded in catching whatever did this. Do you guys think I should go back in the woods? I think any kind of evidence would have been taken away by now. I don't want to risk getting caught, and maybe being an actual danger. I'm really glad this site exists, so I could at least share my story. I really didn't expect anybody to believe me, because why would you? I hope this is the last story I have to tell, but I'll come back if there's more, I promise. I know one thing for sure though, I definitely don't want to be a survivalist anymore, anymore, anymore. Seven kids have gone missing in my town in the last three decades. I was a part of the search party for the seventh. This is our story. The child's parents had left him in the care of a neighbor while they ran to the gas station and the neighbor, an elderly woman, could not keep up with the boy while they played. So she eventually sat to rest. The boy, not at all tired, wanted to keep up playing, but the old woman was exhausted and told him to wait until his parents returned. He asked if he could play with her husband, who lay in bed upstairs, but she said no, explaining to him that her husband was very tired due to his age, like she had become. As any seven-year-old would, the boy found this answer unacceptable and fled to the backyard, hoping to find something or someone to play with. He didn't return. The old woman, whose name was Margaret, had fallen asleep in her living room. She was stirred awake by the sound of the doorbell and shambled over to the front door. Awaiting her there were the boy's parents, whom she greeted and then remembered that she had been charged with looking after their son. The sudden remembrance, which dawned plainly on the woman's face, brought an immediate worry to the faces of the parents. And the trio began to call out for the boy their shouts fell on deaf ears though. The boy was long gone. I was one of the volunteer searchers, and the particular group I had accompanied was tasked with searching the nearby woods. By the time people had gathered and the police had arrived, it was nearly nightfall, so some of us had to push through the trees and vegetation blindly. A surprising amount of people did not own flashlights. I was one such person. I did bring my father's emergency flare gun, which he thankfully never had to use during his boating days. Normally inadvisable, considering I'd be surrounded by vegetation, but I figured it would be useful if my group discovered the boy, hopefully alive. I stumbled over roots, pushed through brambles which tore my shirt and cut my skin, and trampled flowers unidentifiable in the gloom. 
The moonlight shone dimly through the trees whose foliage had formed a natural ceiling over the woods. Eventually, expectedly, I became separate from my search group, lost amidst the unrecognizable flora. Panic crept into my mind, but I figured that with dozens of other people out searching for the boy, I was bound to come across someone. And pushing past panic was the hope that maybe the boy had stumbled through these parts of the woods as well, and I'd be the one to find him. Then, as if to assuage my fears and affirm my hopes, I saw a figure a few meters ahead, leaning against a tree. My heartbeat was faster when I saw that. He was not all that tall, about the size of a boy even. I jogged towards him, but when I grew close enough to see his face, he ran off. I chased after, calling out the boy's name, Adam. It started to rain. I sloshed through the mud which had minutes ago been easily traversable ground. My progress hampered considerably. I could still see the boy ahead, but he grew smaller, fainter, and even though I tried to power through, I felt myself succumbing to the thickening mud. It became like a quicksand, restricting my entire body, resisting my most strenuous exertions. It was too late when I remembered that I was probably quickening my sink with my struggles. Seconds later, I was up to my chin. I'd apparently stumbled upon some deep depression in the earth. Forgetting the flare gun in my pocket, I tried calling out, but the rain fell loudly, drowning out my screams as I drowned in that sinkhole. Darkness rushed in, and all became black. I emerged elsewhere. The earth vomited me forth like a squelch, as if expelling something indigestible. The rain was gone here, and the environment was illuminated by several distinct rays of moonlight, as if this place were watched over by a trio of moons. The trees were different as well. They towered incredibly high, their tops piercing the gray cloudage above, as if rising to greet the triple lunar vanguards. Grass rose as tall as men in some places, while other areas were barren, some sunken in others raised in mounds of dirt. I progressed forward from the position I'd arrived, hoping that if the boy had come here, I'd find him, and if not him, a way to escape. The hole from which I had arisen had smoothed over, leaving no signs of being impregnable. I eventually came across something resembling a path. At the start of this path, to my horror, was a massive coffin that towered nearly as tall as the great trees I'd seen earlier. The coffin's lid was open, and it gave off a strange, sinister impression. It seemed hungrily anticipatory, as if it awaited a soon-to-arrive occupant. I gave it a wide berth as I passed, and nothing sprung out of it to attack or draw me in. I came across other caskets, all of which seemed as they were built for titans. Trees, not as tall as the others, but still massive in their own right, had grown through the caskets. Throwing the lids off, but obscuring any signs of the occupants, if there were any. Great bows pierced through the frame of the casket, giving the trees the appearance of wearing polished wooden armor. As I progressed down the coffin-flanked path, the funerary housing became degraded, more noticeably withered by time and the trees which grew through them became significantly more prominent, until, at the final tree, the only observable presence of the casket were its splinters which stuck in with what seemed like grim defiance to the trunk of the tree. This tree was as tall as the others I'd initially seen. Something about it, perhaps its age and disregard for the casket through which it had grown, saddened me. There was also a vague, unplaceable familiarity about the casket shards, as if I'd somehow seen them or inexplicably knew of their occupant before coming here. The path lined with casket-infused trees ended seven in total, and opened to a massive swampish area. In the center of the mire was a massive pool, which over hovered a soft white mist. Despite the locale, I could hear no bugs or bog-inhabiting creatures, and the water surface was at a complete rest. 
I approached the pool, drawn into it by some unreal force and my own fixation by its mesmeric surface. Without consciously doing so, I'd walk right into the pool, and only until the water shifted did I notice. The water, which had been a placid and translucent green, turned dark and violent, churning viciously, rocking my body helplessly to and fro. The white mist changed to a dismal red and suddenly felt like a great encumbrance on my body as I tried to hold my footing in the sloshing waves. Rain started to fall, making the pool's level rise until it was up to my chest. The coffins behind me, engorged by the mammoth trees, seemed to groan in agony as their burdens expanded to nightmarish proportions within them, splintering the wood of which they were made. Beneath me, I began to hear a voice calling from the depths of the pool, and peering in, I saw what looked like a boy. My instinctual desire to extricate myself from the pool was overridden by my desire to save the child, so I plunged downward into the murk. I reached him, surprisingly. I grabbed the boy, who to my short-lived joy resembled Adam. I had found him, somehow trapped in this abysmal place. I held him to me with one arm and used the other to propel myself upward, all the while fighting the monstrous currents which battered me underwater as much as they did above it. When the realization that I wouldn't reach the surface before my lungs burst came to me, I found myself crying. Not for my own life, but for the boy who I couldn't save. Somehow, the tears felt warm against my body, as if they clung to my face instead of getting mixed within the Stygian waters around me. In a last moment of consciousness, I withdrew the flare gun from my pocket and extended my arm as far as it would go, kicking my legs to hopefully stay close to the surface for the gun to fire properly. I wasn't sure if it was going to work, honestly. But it was all that I had, and thankfully, my finger pulled the trigger seconds after consciousness fully left me, and we sank downward into the abyssal death. I awoke in a hospital bed, with a nurse attending to me. She smiled and said she'd go get the doctor. When they returned, they were accompanied by another woman. She looked familiar, but I couldn't place her, either due to the drugs assuredly pumped into my system, or my own wariness at the half-remembered ordeal. Together, the doctor and woman informed me of what had happened. My absence from the search party had pretty much gone unnoticed until they'd given up for the night, and a sort of roll call was conducted to make sure everyone got back safely. When I hadn't made myself present, the people resumed their search, this time for me, which the woman admitted to being happy about, because she was Adam's mother and hadn't wanted to give up looking for him. Rather than splitting up again and risking more being lost, they surged through the trees together, collectively sweeping through the indarkened wood. At some point, perhaps an hour into the search, a flare shot exploded into the sky. Due to the downpour and the thick, visually obstructing treetops, they could only partially trace the path of the flare. They searched the areas from which they suspected it had been fired, but found nothing. Tired and drenched, Talk of returning to their home started up, and some started to make their way back to the neighborhood. Before the last had gone, the woman, Adam's mother, heard crying. She approached the sound and found me holding her son in my arms, wailing, the flare gun at my side. Around us, washed up from a shallow grave, were other children. Adam was the only one alive among them. I was insensate, totally unresponsive, crying dumbly. Adam was unconscious, but not seriously harmed. We were both taken to the hospital and I was placated to quietness along the way. When Adam awoke, he told the authorities that the old man, husband of Margaret, had taken him, hurt him, and left him among the others in a shallow pit, which he'd first uncovered to place Adam inside, then afterwards resealed. The rain had washed away the recently piled soil, which had not had time to harden and become overgrown as had happened since the last time such an atrocity was committed. The old man was arrested, and after a few hours of questioning, admitted to being responsible for the seven missing children in the last 30 years. Adam, fully recuperated and wanted to thank me, he was brought in and rushed to my bedside. He hugged me, thanked me relentlessly, and his mother did as well. The doctor informed me that I'd be fine and can return home in the evening. 
They all left, letting me rest. I was happy to see Adam alive and well, but something troubled me. I realized that while he was the boy I had seen in the water, he definitely was not the one who led me to the place where I had fallen into the sinkhole. Later, once I returned home, I looked at pictures of the missing children. After scrolling through the pictures, I finally came across the first missing child, who had gone missing in the late 80s. Even though I hadn't got a good look at the child who led me to that sinkhole, I knew that this is the one. I also knew, somehow, that the last casket I'd come across in that extra mundane realm, the one obliterated by the tree, had been his, had been his, had been his. I'm going to tell you the story of when my friends and I went camping and came face to face with what I can only describe as a monster. I'm an outdoorsy type of guy. I love hiking, hunting, bird watching, rock climbing, river swimming, sex under the stars in the back of my jeep, all that stuff. I camped often and I was very familiar with the forests of Oregon. I knew what animals could hurt me, how I could deter them and which plant wouldn't put me in a hospital if I ate them. So when I planned a routine camping trip with three of my buddies, mostly to get my girlfriend breaking up with me out of my mind, I was thinking it'd be fun. Some beer, hunting, a little more beer, laughing, more beer. You know, I was wrong. It all started the first night we were out there. Christian had taken us on some really extreme hiking trails, as he described it. One that the three of us had never been on. None of us were really scared. We were all mid-twenties guys in great shape, so... We figured if Chris knew the way, we'd be fine. And we were. We set up camp after falling just a bit short of our ten-mile goal we started out with in the morning. We were happy to sit down and lighten our cooler a bit by having a few beers. Fast forward to a few hours, and more than a few beers later, we were shouting and carrying on as the campfire licked the darkness away from our circle. Any animal noises we heard were shrugged off. No animal in the right mind would dare come near a commotion like this. But suddenly we heard something that wasn't an animal noise. We all paused as Jared raised his hand and turned his head so his ear was pointing towards the sound. It was the sound of tires rolling over fallen leaves and branches unmistakably conjoined with the low hum of a running engine, we all reached for our weapons. We each had a hunting rifle that we suddenly all had in our laps. You might think this to be a bit extreme, but you never know what crazy, wrong-turn lunatics you're going to run into in the woods past midnight. And besides, the sound of the tires was close, coming towards us. The most off-putting thing, though, beyond our fire, was the inky blackness of night. No headlights. We were all silent. The noise was just beyond the tree line of the small clearing we were in now. A car door opened. The jingling of keys. A car door closed. Then footsteps. A clearer crunching of foliage and fallen branches. I had enough. I raised my rifle towards the sound. They had to be just barely out of sight now. So we were very clearly in theirs. What do you want? I asked clearly and sternly, my rifle still pointing in the general direction of the noise. Two palms were the first thing I saw coming out of the darkness, followed by the form of a frail-looking old man walking out of the darkness below them. He had his hands raised in the air, as if I was a cop about to arrest him. I'd wave a white flag, but the only thing white I got is my drawers, he said with a warm smile, broken up by the fact that he was missing about half of his teeth. I lowered my rifle. He slowly made his way out of the ring of twilight that our fire had created against the backdrop of the near full moon sky. He was a caricature. A gray beard hung off of his chin, but bushed out further, then dropped off his face. It was the kind of beard that you would think you'd accidentally eat more than you would trim. He wore a red and black plaid shirt and dirty, faded jeans, big black oversized rubber boots, and a discrepant looking Cabela's hat to try and contain the thin and frail hair that stuck out from under it. 
and shot off in every direction. There he stood, a big goofy grin still on his face. Mind if I join you fellas for a spell? He spoke in a thick accent, somewhere in the south I couldn't place. Why are you here in the woods with no headlights on? And Chris trailed off as he looked at his watch. Almost 2 a.m., he finished. The mysterious hillbilly stranger took a seat on one of the particular big pieces of firewood that Duncan had lugged over. Well, I'm out here because you out here, son. My grip tightened on my rifle again, and I didn't move it. The fuck does that mean? Duncan chimed in with his usual tough guy bravado as he leaned forward in his camping chair. I'm here because you fellas don't know these trees too good. I'm here to tell you that you're wandering into the big guy's territory, he said as he spoke with his hands. So you're the big guy then, I take it, I said, almost laughing. No, no, son. I ain't no monster. But this thing is, he said vaguely. There's a monster in the woods? I asked blatantly and bluntly, trying to make it very clear with my tone that I knew he was full of shit. But then Jared had to get him going. Uh, what's it look like? Jared asked, none of my skepticism present in his voice. Uh, teeth. About as big as your forearm, I'd say. He got dark leathery skin. Natives call it tree shaker. Big as your house. He rhymed off. Not as big as my house. Duncan interrupted again. Listen, buddy. I don't believe you. And even if I did... There isn't anything in these woods Sheila and I can't handle, he said as he patted his rifle in his lap. He named his gun. Of course he did. Listen, son. I don't give a care if you believe me or not. I'm just being a good citizen out here in these United States and telling you that your being out here is dangerous. His voice grew more grim as he spoke. He ain't like other animals. Never seen him spooked. He likes hooting and hollering like you fellas are doing. Fire and light don't scare him neither. As far as that pea shooter goes, you better bring some military grade firepower if you're gonna hurt him. He warned gravely. I still wasn't buying it. Listen buddy, you've got nothing to worry about now. We're gonna shack up and get some sleep, and we'll be on the move shortly after sunrise, I told him. Now get out of here you old windbag. Duncan finished for me. The old man stood up from his wooden perch and gave an exacerbated sigh. All right, boys. All right. Don't bother running if he sees you. He shook his head as he turned away and began to walk back to his vehicle. Damn thing ran my old jeep down, he continued as he walked. That was a nice fucking jeep, too. Real good jeep. He continued about his long-gone jeep as his voice disappeared into the trees. We heard his tires roll away slowly, and once more, we were alone. Well, that killed the mood, Chris said flatly. The sun rose on an uneventful morning. We all greeted the daylight with the usual grogginess that seven or eight beers tend to bring on. There were some murmurs about the crazy old man from last night, myself included. It was a pretty weird interaction. We didn't dwell on it too long, though, and started moving again. We planned to continue hiking for another 5k to get to this ridge that Chris kept talking about. Amazing view, apparently. Every time an animal crossed our path, some joke would pop up about the old guy from the night before. This monster hides your jeep. It's the old dude's wife. Stuff like that. The one that got the biggest laugh was when Duncan jumped back when a bird flew out of a tree over our heads. Look out, it's the tree shaker, he announced in an Ace Ventura kind of style. At the very least, the late night interaction had given us something to carry on about. We continued all morning until he stopped for lunch. About two bites into my chicken sandwich, I stopped chewing, thinking I heard something. I waited. There it was again. It was like I didn't hear the original sound, just the echo. I shushed everyone and told them to listen. Once again, an echo. What's that? You're the bird guy, Jared asked me because of my bird watching background. He was right. It did sound like a bird. 
bigger though, and definitely not just a bird. There was a ferocity behind it, akin to a lion's roar. Whatever it is, it's far off, I replied. After all, we could barely hear it. It's probably just a wounded animal. They make all kinds of crazy sounds when they're dying, Duncan responded. Seemed to make sense. And Duncan was even more of an outdoorsman than me. So we decided he was right. A few more minutes of eating, and we were back on the road. It was uneventful for a while. Chris kept saying how we were almost there. It's just another few hours, but he was right on with his directions. We came to the crest of the mythological ridge. It was a sight to behold. The land dipped down into a shadow valley, and then up again into a dwarf mountain. Trees and plants bloomed right into the horizon, and a river ran through the valley. We figured it was a good enough place to set up camp. As we were laying out our sleeping bags, Jared called everyone over to look over the edge again. There it was, clear as day. Three or four trees all in a bunch had just shook violently. I hate to say it, but all those trees are definitely shaking, Jared said, some fear in his voice. We were quiet for a little while. Probably a bear orgy. Yeah, bear orgy. Duncan and Chris both joked and agreed with each other so quickly, I wasn't even sure who said what. Their confidence and levity seemed to win over Jared. His brief moment of fright seemed to have passed. Everyone got back to setting up camp. I kept an eye on the trees, though. They were still shaking, but the shaking trees were moving, like something just walking through was shaking them. I never mentioned the fact that the other trees were moving. I put it out of my mind. It was another night of beer and good times. We were loud and rambunctious again. God, what a time. We shut down around three o'clock. I went to bed happy. I woke up terrified. Once again, I heard that weird call from the distance. I sat up. The smoldering fire illuminated everyone just enough to let me know none of them heard it. Maybe I was just hearing things. I laid back down. I couldn't sleep, though. I was sure I heard it. Then I heard the footsteps off in the distance. Far, but closing in. Don't bother trying to run from it. The old man's words rang in my head. So I stayed where I was. I didn't wake anyone up. I didn't make a sound. Its footsteps were getting closer. It was walking directly towards us. It sounded so heavy, like it was made out of cast iron. The footsteps grew so loud, I couldn't believe no one else was hearing them. Eventually, they slowed down, but it was literally right next to us. I held my breath. I chose the worst position to sleep in. The crown of my head was pointing towards it as I laid there. I was totally and utterly useless. I couldn't even see the thing that was about to eviscerate me. Just beyond the tree line, it started its calculated steps. It crushed huge branches as it walked. It sounded like an elephant walking on a field of chicken bones. Suddenly, Duncan stirred and looked over in my direction. What the fuck? Holy fuck! He screamed as he tried to scramble to his feet. The beast lunged past me and towards Duncan. The weight of its foot landing next to me almost made me bounce off the ground. What happened next was a blur. Primal fear took over me as I clambered out of my sleeping bag and to my feet as I darted into the woods. I didn't know if it got Duncan. I didn't know where Jared and Chris were. I didn't know where I was running. But I ran faster than any person has ever ran. It seemed like an eon before I found another break in the trees. But it was probably only a few minutes of sprinting. I came upon a gravel road. My socked feet weren't much protection from a jagged rock that shot into my foot. I shrieked in anguish before remembering my situation. I stifled any more noise. And as I was looking at my injured foot once again, I heard the footsteps. About fifty feet in front of me, it emerged from the tree line once again. It stood in the middle of the gravel road, looking away from me, 
so big that even standing in the center of the road, its thick tail was still in the bushes. The full moon illuminated it perfectly. No, it couldn't be. As the leaves it loosened from the surrounding trees fluttered down between us, it turns to me, almost in cinematic slow motion. There it stood. A Tyrannosaurus Rex. Anyway, yeah, I ran away. We all got away, actually. Except Duncan. He's dead as hell. 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 So, you want to go hunting. Maybe you're hungry, maybe you're looking to sell, or maybe you're just batshit crazy and want to find something to show to the world. Well, here's a guide to the one thing you don't do. Don't mess with the skimwalkers. Stories of ten-foot beasts, pale as snow, claws like kitchen knives, and teeth like drills. I can tell you one thing. They're freaking real. So, a while back, a couple of my mates and I were getting pissed. We had just killed a bear harassing campers and were boasting over our win against nature. I remember my mate, Nathan, said something along the lines of, I bet we can kill anything anyone throws at us. But he was cut off by the sound of a glass hammering down on the counter. We all turned around to face the origin of the noise and we saw some old guy. Not your average veteran who's down on his luck. I mean, some poor frick who's been beaten half to death by life while watching everything he loves die. So, you wanna go hunting? He said, his tone low and rough. It seemed like his voice was shaking. Yeah, what's it to you, old man? Retorted my other mate, Alex. He was laughing and trying to imitate this guy's hunch and facial features until he got hit in the face with a glass. The guy looked pissed, properly pissed. Like kicked in the balls by the guy who shagged your girl pissed. You know nothing of these woods, boy. If you won't be the king of the world, I'll give you a challenge you can't back down from. He chucked an old diary at us. Go claim your glory and come back to me when it's done. He then swiveled on his stool and ordered another drink. Mark picked up the diary and handed it to me, his eyes full of excitement. We left the bar and flicked through the diary entries for a few months past. Photographs of some sort of family and sketches of dozens of dozens of sketches, scribbled and looking like they'd been done in seconds of a human, but not a human. Something lanky and hunched over. Every sketch, the thing wasn't facing the artist. It looked like it was feasting on something. But, that, that wasn't important. Logs on expeditions, describing his hunt for this thing. This Wendigo, Rake, Skimwalker, Shy Guy, Goatman. Multiple names were given to it. This guy's lost it. Someone chuckled. Let's just leave it. Find some wolves or something that people want gone. But I shook my head. We couldn't just leave it. This guy may have been mad, but the pictures look so similar and detailed. Bullet holes, scratches, scars. Every tiny mark was noted. No. I heard myself mutter. No. We gotta do this. Imagine what people would say when we drag this thing's rotting shitbag of a body back to town. People will call us heroes. We'll go down in history for finding a new species. My rallying speech obviously worked and the guys cheered. That was the worst thing I ever did. Even to this day. We call up more mates and gather everything together. We have 50 caliber rifles, 
shotguns, 44s, and a few knives. In total, we have 19 guys. The more the merrier, and some sleeping bags, tents, cans of food, etc. We hop in our vans and follow the guys' directions to find a place to camp for the night, and we'll hunt the next day. We light a fire, drinking sing like madmen, and eventually start to get ready to sleep. Mark goes off for a slash, and I remember the sound of howling, but not wolf howls, low guttural moans, but too loud for moans, if that makes any sense. Imagine a guy whose throat has been ripped out. A few of us heard it, and my mate, Alex, jokes, hey, is Mark having some fun with his girl? Which gets a laugh from the group, like it was the funniest joke in the world. But it wasn't funny for long. I woke up to the sound of screaming, retching and vomiting. I grabbed my rifle and pushed myself out of the tent to see what the commotion was about. Oh, oh God. Uh, oh God. Oh fuck me, holy shit. H how? Alex was shouting the loudest over the jittery and terrified shrieks of the guys. I pushed past and... And, and we, we see Mark. But, but... But not Mark. He was impaled by a branch, his left arm gone, his right hand gone, and his torso sliced open, his entrails hanging out of his body and, and dangling on the dirt, and he is coated in blood, and that's when I notice his, his face is contorted into a scream, but his jaw is missing, along with his eyes. We have to pull him down, and chunks of him fall off, cursing more vomiting and cries ensuing. Oh god, Mark. Mark, I'm so sorry. Alex was crying now. He'd pissed himself at this point, and I was on the verge of shitting bricks. S some fucker did this, and we, we won't let him get away. Some big guy called Ralph, a friend of Alex, ra rallied. L let's get this fucker. He cries out, and we all cheer. We grab our shit and follow a blood trail someone left. Except for Alex. He is sitting by his tent and drinking between sobs. Y you ain't coming? I ask nervously, to which he smiles weakly. Nah, nah, man, go, go get that bitch for Mark and me. He sipped his beer and, and stared ahead. I patted on him on the back and I jogged after the others. We reached a cave entrance. The scent of sulfur was so strong I had to cover my mouth and nose with the collar of my shirt. However, it did not block out the stench. The entrance was caked in blood and carcasses of poor creatures, their bones decaying under the sun, streaming through the branches. The crunching of bones and the tearing of flesh echoed in the cave and gave me goosebumps. So, this thing is still feasting. Enjoy your last meal, fucker, I thought. Ralph decided we would set a trap and butchered the thing once it was caught off guard. We all nodded and followed our orders, and we caught a deer, slit its throat, and left it to bleed out. I wait and prop my rifle between two branches, and aim it by the deer. Others are hiding in bushes or behind trees with machetes, bowie knives, and other firearms. Around a half an hour later, Sam got bored and yelled, I'ma get this fucker! He cocked his 44 and marched into the cave. We tried to stop him, but he made up his mind and marched in. You were all silent, as as I'm staring around the corpse, I notice the amount of creatures' paw prints. So, so many of them. But not the same creature. As if every creature on Noah's fucking ark stopped by this stomp on the ground. Wait a minute, I heard myself whisper. When did wolves start walking on two legs? I was then interrupted by the most heart-wrenching noise anyone has ever let escape from their mouth. A scream. Not just any scream. You hear recorded in movies or anything like that. A scream too high pitched to be a guy's, but we knew it was. It started off as a shocked gasp. Very soon, shots rang out through the cave and it sounded like Sam's throat would break open and then thumps. Heavy thumps of a body against stone. Then nothing. I hear myself whisper, fuck, and then a sob escaped my throat before I see it. This hairless human, 
tall as the tallest NBA player and then some. Lanky as hell, and completely naked. That's when shit truly hit the fan. Ralph and a few other guys charged at it and tried to pin it down, but it just cut them down very easily. I cried out, kill it, but I barely heard it myself. But we were all on the same page and shot every round that we had. We emptied every clip, but nothing, nothing. It just kept hacking and slashing and biting and clawing and screaming at the guys in front of it until they were all just a pile of butchered meat. We had 17 men at the start of the attack, and they were dropping like flies. Dylan's legs were sliced clean off. Carl had his face smashed under the thing's giant foot. Andrew was smashed into the ground repeatedly until his body began to fall apart. And Ralph, he was lifted by the thing, by each arm, and ate his head whole before ripping his torso apart. The others were cut down in a blur, leaving eight. Me, Michael, Daniel, Nathan, Chris, Max, and two other guys stood up in pure fear. I couldn't give less of a shit if we killed it at this point. I had pissed myself. I had no second thoughts of the situation, and I, I, I bolted. I left the guys to die. I looked back to see that Nathan and Michael were behind me, followed by Daniel, Chris, Max, and two other guys. I didn't know following close behind. The, th the thing, I don't know how it had reached us, but it did. I saw it slap one of the guys into a tree trunk. With a sickening crunch, he crumpled immediately, and the other guy got sliced in half by one of this thing's massive claws. Max tripped, but we couldn't care less. We heard his cries and the crunching of bones as his spine was ripped out of his back and he lay still. We kept on running. I don't know how far we got, but when we got to the camp, Alex was poking the fire with a stick. I remember screaming, start the fucking van, and he looked up, his gaze fixed behind us, and he looked terrified, and then angry, angrier than that fucking twat back at the pub. He picked up a branch and shoved it in the fire. We ran past him, and he tried dragging him with us, but he brushed us off calmly, but scarily. We started up the van and reversed out of there, but not fast enough to see Alex beating the thing with the branch, every strike harder than the last. He seemed to be winning when I stopped the car. Maybe he'd kill it. And then, and maybe we found his weakness. Fire. We heard him shouting and screaming in an unknown sort of language, full of anger and rage. But when the branch snapped, he noticed it. And so did it. He turned around to run, but was impaled by the creature's slender arm. And we continued to get the fuck out of Dodge. We made it onto the road and hit the gas. We were going over 80, and I looked in... Uh, I looked in the rearview mirror and looked behind us. Th this thing, covered in blood and guts and pieces of guys, simply stared, and then ran with incomprehensible speed, and it was gone. We parked outside the bar, well, crashed into a pole and raced inside, crying and shouting. The, the forest! Daniel cried before falling to his knees. Chris vomited and cried, hugging himself and staring at the ground. Michael was silent and Nathan sobbed into his shoulder. That's the last thing I remember before blacking out. I woke up in a hospital. Men in black looking motherfuckers were standing around with some nurses until they noticed I was conscious and the nurses were ushered out. I was then treated to an interrogation of what some Al Qaeda member would expect after being caught planning 9-11. They gave me no good cop bad cop shit and gave it to me straight. Who was with us? What did we find? Did anyone mail to make it out? How did you survive? I answered without debate once I saw a black suitcase filled with tools beside me. They got me to sign a long piece of paper stating that I would never discuss any of this encounter to any living being. And then they left. And that was that. I was expected to just walk out pretending everything was fine. I never saw that old guy who got us to enter those woods again, and I hope he's been taken and is being tortured somewhere dark and cold. <laughs> maybe Iceland. It's been seven weeks since the incident. Chris shot himself five days ago, and Daniel has been placed into intense mental care and a psych ward. 
Michael and Nathan are the only ones I don't uh, <sighs> Michael and Nathan are the only ones I see anymore. We never talk about it, and we live our lives. Trying to forget the scarring ordeal. But I don't think we ever will. And that's the story, guys. But not really. I still see that thing in my nightmares. I still hear its screams mixed with the others. But I will never forget Alex's face at the branch broke. So, if there's one thing to learn from this, whatever you hear, however, so, no matter how much somebody offers you, stay away from skimwalkers or be prepared to suffer a worse punishment that any sicko could conjure up. I'm taking my dogs out for a hunt soon, cause some feral ones have been racing around my hut and is pissing me off. I don't know how they began walking on their high legs though. The mountains were so beautiful. I made a stop to an overlook on the Blue Ridge Parkway. According to the old wooden sign, the elevation was 3,584 feet above sea level. The fall colors were so bright and overwhelming. This was the perfect weekend to be on the parkway. It was definitely the prime time for seeing the fall colors and their perfect beauty. In another couple of weeks, the leaves would start falling off. Lots of folks are terrible at timing their trips to be here in the prime time, but I am evidently pretty darn good at it. I just realized how big I was smiling. I was so happy to be off for the weekend and by myself to get a much needed break from my mundane accounting job. That big smile I was wearing just dissolved pretty quickly with my remembrance of my dead end unfulfilling job. I took one last look and hopped in my car, and checked on my GPS the distance to my cabin rental for the weekend. It was just a few more miles down the road. The road was almost pitch black and it felt like I was driving through a tunnel that was on fire. I was happy that my rental would be at a high elevation. The GPS is showing one mile to go, and the car was still climbing upward. From the directions I was given by the cabin owners, the Swansons, I would be looking for a narrow dirt road on my right. The name was simply Victoria Lane. It was a rather distinguished name for such a narrow dirt road at the top of the mountain. I turn in and make my way up the narrow, rocky, and winding road. The tree's branches were hanging down as if they were trying to grab the roof of the car and stop me from going any further. As I looked in the rear view mirror, I saw a dust cloud following me. One thing I did not see were houses. Just trees and some rocks. Then the road started to get steep. Very steep. It started to freak me out to be quite honest. I was driving a Mini Cooper. And it took everything the poor little car had to keep going. How in the hell do people get up this road in the rain or snow? Thank God the road was starting to level out a couple of minutes later and didn't sound like my engine was about to have a heart attack anymore. I drove a couple of minutes more and I see a two-story log cabin on the left. This was the Swanson's home and where I would be getting the keys to the rental. This house was gorgeous. It looked like something that would be on the cover of a mountain scenery calendar. These folks had to be loaded. I pulled into the driveway and got out of the car. The car looked to be relieved that it was finally going to be able to rest. I jokingly pat the little car on the hood. Yep, these people were loaded. There was a newer model Range Rover in the garage and a sleek Tesla parked right alongside it. I was not sure what these folks did for a living but business was evidently very good. I was met at the front door before I even knocked by a middle-aged woman with blonde hair and a very petite figure. She gave a smile. It certainly appeared to be forced, but I didn't really care. I'm not here to make friends, just here to get my cabin key. Mr. Smith, I presume. 
the woman said solemnly. Yes, you have a beautiful home. Thank you for renting out your cabin to me, I said. The house is too large and is more trouble than it's worth, she said in a very sorrowful voice. I thought it was a rather weird statement, but I shrugged it off. Well, I am certainly impressed with it, I said quickly. Here are your keys. The cabin is up the road. Enjoy your stay, she said and shut the door quickly. I turned around and mumbled, good talk. As I got back in my car, I drove down the cement driveway back to Victoria Lane. The road curved around the back of the house which was just as immaculate as the front. There was a very impressive pool and pool house out back. The pool house would put a lot of people's real houses to shame. The road started to get steep again. I shifted the car into low and the mini huffed and puffed for a little while longer then I came upon a clearing and saw the cabin up on the left. This cabin was even more beautiful than the pictures online. It was basically a smaller version of the owner's home. I saw a man in the yard trimming the hedges. He looked to be middle-aged as well, so I was assuming he was Mr. Swanson. He didn't seem to notice me driving up, or either he just didn't give a damn. Hey there, one hell of a place you have out here. Gorgeous, I said to the man with his back turned. He didn't respond at all. I got my suitcase and walked up the wood steps to the porch. I unlocked the door and placed my suitcase inside. I turned around to offer a second attempt at conversation with the man. I heard a motor starting, and he was driving off on one of those John Deere Gators without even looking my way whatsoever. Jeez, whatever happened to good old Southern hospitality? I shrugged and went into the house and looked around. It was spotless and looked like a pottery barn catalog. They definitely spared no expense on the furniture and decorations. The cabin had a very pleasant woody aroma and a nice potpourri smell, but not too strong. Just right. I went into the bedroom and just fell face first onto the incredibly comfortable king-sized bed. I was worn out from the long ride, and I decided to take a short nap. I had almost drifted off to sleep when I heard a knock on the door. I was certainly startled as I was almost asleep in the fact that I shouldn't be having visitors. I didn't think the very sociable owners would have dropped by for tea. I got up and slowly went to the front door. There was no one there. Maybe I was in a dream state and just thought I heard a knock. I then heard a squeaking sound to my left. I went outside the front door onto the rustic wraparound porch and began to walk left. The wood made creaking noises as I slowly walked down the porch. As I rounded the corner of the house, I saw a little girl in a tire swing attached to an enormous oak tree that had to have been a couple of hundred years old. She had long brown hair and she was also wearing a yellow dress. She was staring at me and giving me a big smile like she knew me well. Hello? I said in a perplexed tone. Hi there. My mommy and daddy own the cabin, and we live just down the way, she said. Okay, great. This cabin is terrific. What's your name? I asked. Victoria, she replied. Oh, cool. So your parents named the road after you. Can't say I have my own road, I said with a grin. Yeah, it's pretty great. I never forget my address, she said with a giggle. The little girl appeared to be eight or nine years old. I didn't ask because I thought it might sound a little too creepy. Do your mom and dad know you're up here? I asked. Yeah, I spend a lot of time outside and I love the swing. There's a path right there that goes directly to my house. You should check it out sometime. My dad even built me a treehouse down that way. I squinted and strained to see since the sun was shining. Yep, I think I see the path over there. Sure, I'll check it out before I leave. I always wanted a treehouse when I was little. I never got one though. Definitely one of the drawbacks of growing up in the city, I said. It was nice to meet you, Victoria. I'm going to head in for a nap. I am rather pooped from the long drive here, I said. Yes, sir. Nice meeting you too. She waved and continued to swing as I turned my way into the house. I headed back into the bedroom, still hearing the squeaking from the swing outside. I opened up the bedroom window to let in some fresh mountain air. I lay back down and drifted to sleep. A knock at the door jolted me awake, 
It was dark outside and I glanced at the red numbers on the old clock that read 9.30. Then there was another knock. Coming, I yelled. I slowly dragged myself out of bed and headed to the front door. I glanced through the curtain and saw that it was Victoria smiling at me, holding a basket. Hey Victoria, kinda late. What's up? Do your mom and dad know you're up here? I thought it was rather odd for her not to be in bed at this time of night. Yes sir, they know. They sent me up here to give you this. She said excitedly. She handed me a wooden basket that contained a linen cloth wrapped around something. The cloth was warm and had a nice aroma coming from whatever it was wrapped around. I slowly unwrapped the mystery object. It was chocolate chip cookies. Wow, cookies, hot too, I said. Yep, I helped mommy bake them myself. We always bake a batch for new guests. I'm sorry we didn't get it up here sooner. Well, good night. It is my bedtime and mommy told me to hurry back. She smiled and took off rather quickly. Thank you and please tell your mom thank you for me. I yelled as she ran into the darkness. I went back into the cabin with my cookies and plopped down on the sofa. I flipped on the TV and started shoving cookies in my mouth. Damn, these are good cookies, I mumbled to myself as I ravenously devoured it. Before I knew it, I had eaten all of them in the basket. I saw that the TV had Netflix on it, so I loaded up the app and found Doctor Who and watched for a couple of hours before I dozed off again. I woke up at about 6 a.m. the next morning and decided to get an early start. I planned to head to Grandfather Mountain and do a little hiking. I got dressed and headed out the door to my car. I sped off down the gravel road. I had to ride the brakes due to the steep grade. I glanced over at the owner's home, and there didn't seem to be any activity. It made sense, it was an early Saturday morning. As I rounded the last turn before getting to the highway, I slammed on the brakes. There was a little girl laying on the ground beside a bicycle. It, it was Victoria. I jumped out of the car and sprinted to the little girl. She was crying and her jeans were ripped at the knee, and she was bleeding. Victoria, are you okay? I exclaimed. Yeah, I think so. I just cut my knee. It's bleeding pretty bad. She said amid her painful sobs. She had quite a gas. Blood was flowing down her leg like lava out of a volcano. We need to put some pressure on it. Let me get something out of my car to put on it, I said. I was a volunteer firefighter in my community back home, and I had my EMT certification, so I knew a thing or two about first aid. As I was getting up, she stopped me. We can just use this sweatshirt. It is old and worn out, no biggie, she said. She untied the sleeves of the white Hello Kitty sweatshirt from around her waist and handed it to me. I promptly placed it on her knee and started pressure. She let out a small cry of pain. The cut was bad enough. It was worse than I had thought. The stitches were definitely going to be needed. At least a couple. We need to get you back to your mom, I said. I looked at her pink bike and looked at her. Listen, I have a bike rack at the back of my car. I'm going to put your bike on there, and then we'll head up to your house. Now put your hand here, and keep putting pressure on it until it stops bleeding. I said quickly, but calmly, not to make her any more upset. I got up and picked up the little pink bike and walked to the back of my car and latched it on. Afterward, I walked around to get Victoria. She was gone, except for her bloody sweatshirt. I looked around, frantically yelling her name, but nothing. It was like she just vanished into thin air. It didn't take me more than a minute to get her bike attached to my car. She didn't have enough time to go anywhere without me noticing. This was insane. Where is she? I pulled out my cell phone and searched for the Swanton's phone number and called. There were three rings before I heard a woman's voice. Hi, Mrs. Swanson, this is the renter Terry Smith. As I was driving out today, I found Victoria in the road where she had fallen off her bike. She is fine, she has a cut on her knee, but other than that, she is good. She is putting pressure on it now. However, as I was attaching her bike to my car, she ran off. Is she back at the house by any chance? I said out of breath. Victoria! She yelled. Then there was a pause. Then the line went dead. This is freaking weird, I said to myself. I decided to call out Victoria's name a few more times, but there was still no answer. I walked over to both sides of the road peering into the woods, but she wasn't there. Why wasn't she answering me? She couldn't be far at all. Why would she just run off? It hit me that she may have left a blood trail, 
her leg was gushing pretty good. I am also willing to bet it started flowing faster when she started moving. I looked all over and saw nothing. I got back to the car and headed back to the house and looked out the window for her along the way. I threw the sweatshirt in the back seat and proceeded to do a three-point turn in the road. As I started back up the road, I heard what sounded like a siren. I stayed put for a moment and looked in my rearview mirror and saw a sheriff's deputy pull into the road behind me. The deputy bolts out of the car with his weapon raised and yelled for me to get out of my car with my hands up. He is a very large muscular guy with sunglasses. However, all I was paying attention to was the handgun pointed straight at me. I was in complete shock. I didn't know what the heck was going on. As I was getting out, the Swanchen's Range Rover was speeding towards me from the other direction. What the heck is going on? Why are you pointing a gun at me? I yelled. Shut the F up and get on your knees and put your hands behind your head. The officer yelled. I heard the Range Rover slam on the brakes and slide into the gravel towards me. Then both doors swung open like horses' gates at a Kentucky Derby. The owners jumped out of the car like it was on fire. Where is my daughter? Where is she? The woman screamed. Her husband said nothing. He appeared to be too shocked to say anything. He just ran behind his wife. Jesus. She was just here and then she was gone, I said. Where is the girl? said the deputy. I don't know. She fell off her bike and she was here. I pointed at the bike of my car to show I wasn't completely crazy about what I was saying. Bill. Oh my god, look. She started sobbing uncontrollably when she looked at the bike. S is that Victoria's bike, ma'am? The deputy said. Yes, that's hers. This monster has her, she cried. Have her? What the heck are you talking about? I don't have her. I stopped to help her. That is all. She can't be far. I said. The deputy went to my car and looked all around. He opened the back door and then he began to talk on his radio. I need backup now, he said quickly. Ma'am, is this your daughter's sweatshirt? He said to the frantic mother as she picked up the Hello Kitty sweatshirt covered in blood from Victoria's lacerated knee. Her eyes were wide. She turned completely pale and fell to her knees. Yes, that was what she was wearing when she went missing. Oh my god, is that blood on it? She screamed as she turned towards me. She charged at me screaming. What have you done to my little girl? What have you done? The deputy pulled her off me and she just fell to the ground sobbing. The husband fell down beside her. They were just, they were distraught, and I couldn't blame them, but I had no idea what was happening. The husband looked like he had just seen a ghost for some reason. I didn't do anything to Victoria. This is ridiculous. I was sweating profusely and shaking in disbelief. I was on the verge of hyperventilating. The deputy violently handcuffed me and threw me into the back of the police car. My head slammed against the roof of the car. As more policemen arrived, they scoured the area looking for Victoria. All I could do was shake my head and stare at the floor of the car, trying to wake up from this nightmare. A police officer came and opened the door and questioned me about Victoria. I explained everything I knew, the tire swing, the cookies, the bike, and they just looked at me like I was insane. Maybe I was. I just kept telling them over and over I had not done anything with Victoria other than try to help her. She was somewhere in the woods and they could just, you know, ask her when she was found. The officer made a statement that was burned into my brain that will never leave me. Sir, Victoria has been missing for six months, said the officer. That's impossible. She was here. I saw her yesterday, last night, and this morning. I'm not crazy, I said while holding back tears and vomit. Be that as it may, sir, you are under arrest for kidnapping a Victoria Swampin, and God only knows whatever else you do once you tell us where she is. And you will tell us, said the deputy. He slammed the door and got into the driver's seat. We pulled out onto the highway headed toward where I assumed police station was. I looked back to see a frantic speckle as the officer searched for Victoria. The parents were still on the ground sobbing in each other's arms. We hadn't been a hundred yards down the highway when my blood ran ice cold and my heart sunk all the way to my stomach. I saw a small figure standing in the woods between two pine trees as we rode away. It was her. It was Victoria. With a face of stone, showing no emotion. I began to scream. I began to scream. I began to scream. I began to scream.
I'm awoken in the middle of the night to the sound of thumping and my dog Benjamin barking up a storm. Slowly getting up, I can hear my bones creaking. Age does that to anyone. Walking past a mirror, I stop to look at myself for a second and realize the years haven't been kind to me. Come on, Sawyer, I tell myself. Keep it moving. As I walk out into the living room of my cabin, I listen closely, Benjamin tailing close behind me. It's quiet now, save for the sound of the cold, snowy winds outside. I take a peek outside my window and see nothing, though I'll admit it's hard to see much out in this storm and at this time of night. After a few minutes, I decide to walk back towards my bedroom and lay down again. The warmth of the blankets is welcoming and comforting. Winters are cold out here in the forest and mountains of Washington. The warmth of the blankets makes an old soul like myself not want to get out. If you take me now, God, I'm quite sure I'd never know I died. That's the level of comfort we are speaking of here. Thump, thump, thump. Benjamin goes wild with his barking as I struggle to regain my bearings again. Looking around, I debate if I even want to get up this time. Quiet, boy, I tell Benjamin. It's probably just a storm anyhow. Get some rest. We've got a long winter and not many places to be, my friend. It is with that, Benjamin and I drift off to sleep. Morning arises and after much struggle, due to the aforementioned warmth of the blankets, I finally get up, get dressed, and decide to make some breakfast. Nothing quite like bacon, eggs, and hash browns to start the morning right. I'm pretty far out in the woods, but we do live close enough to a town that is only about an hour to an hour and a half away during the fall and I stock up on plenty of food to go with meat I hunt as well. If there's one way I swear to never leave this earth, it's through starving. My gut is proof of that, I tell you what. I start up some coffee and decide to go out and survey how much snow has fallen since last night. According to the forecast, we were to have a slight lull during the day before snow impacts us hard again, tonight. Looking around, I see I'll have to do some shoveling and clearing out around the cabin, but I figure I can do that after I get some food in me. I turn around and see Benjamin, who just finished his business, run up to me excitedly, tail wagging like the first day I pulled him from his mother, when he was just a wee little pup. Now he's a huge St. Bernard, and my most loyal and devoted friend. His mother passed a few years back, sadly, and the dog that impregnated her never really stuck around. I pet Benjamin, and as I do, I look over at the cabin. That's when I notice something odd. There appears to be some damage to my door. Walking over to examine the door more closely, it seems there are some broken and chipped pieces of wood and a bit of indentation. That's strange. Could the storm have done this? I think on it for a moment but decide ultimately, I'll add reinforcing and repairing to my door to my to-do list, and for the day, move back inside with Benjamin to check on breakfast and the coffee that goes with it. Shutting the door behind us, I finish making my coffee a bit longer. Nothing quite like hot coffee on a cold winter morning. I drink it straight, it reminds me of living in a way. It can be bitter, but it's beautiful ultimately. Once I finish my coffee, I take the time to clean everything up, do my dishes, and then spend much of the rest of my day shoveling snow and repairing and reinforcing my door. I take breaks for the bathroom and to make and eat lunch, but by the time I'm through with it all, the sun is beginning to set. So I move inside, lock and bar the door behind me, and start up dinner. I'm cooking up some deer sausage from a kill I made a bit back. I figure deer sausage with some rice and beans isn't that bad. By the time I'm through, I can barely move from all the food I've eaten. Looking over at Benjamin, I see he seems quite content as well. I take him outside to go to the bathroom before locking up for the night. Turning off all the lights, I then head back to where it takes no time at all for the world to disappear around me. Thump, 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 thump. What the hell is that? Slowly. I force myself up before turning on some lights and heading for the noise. To my shock, 
the barricade on the door is cracked. The barricade is only made of wood, but it's a large piece of lumber. I make a point to add getting a metal bar for the barricade on my to-do list for tomorrow. There isn't any thumping at this point, but it's clear someone or something is trying to get inside my home. I grab my rifle, just in case, and peek through the windows. There doesn't appear to be anything. Granted, my windows aren't large enough for anyone to fit through. They're so small, I'm not so worried about any real sort of threat getting inside that way. The best way is through the front door, and something seems like it wants in. The rest of the night I sit in my chair, covered up, my rifle next to me and pass out as best as I can. When I awake, it's morning. I'm guessing there was no more thumping or maybe I was too tired to notice. I prep breakfast before taking the large piece of wood I slid in a slot as the barricade off and open the door. I can't explain what I saw. My door is somewhat broken and I decide I'll head to town today and get a proper barricade. Maybe even a steel door of some kind after I take care of the snow. It isn't supposed to snow again until tomorrow, so I do just that. Most of my day is spent getting much of the heavier door and replacing the frame and barricade. The door I have is steel, but it is painted in such a way to match the look of the cabin. It isn't perfect, but it'll do and be far more secure. By the time I get home, I have just enough time to fix the door, replace the frame, and set it all up with my new barricade before making dinner and taking Benjamin out for his nightly business. As soon as that's over, I head straight to bed barricading my door before I do. We'll get some sleep tonight, Benjamin. One way or another. We'll get some damn sleep because nothing is getting through that door. It is with that that I pass out, blissfully unaware of the world around me. The next morning I awoke well rested and surprised to find I wasn't awoken by any real noise or banging on my door. Perhaps whatever animal had been doing it simply gave up after the first couple of nights. I did my normal routine of breakfast and soon after took Benjamin out for a walk after locking up. I let him do his business and we played a bit, enjoying the solitude and the beautiful view as we did. It was nice out here. Occasionally you'd get some wild animal aggressively trying to get into your home, but they were usually just hungry and often didn't pose a real threat. Sure. You get stories of people who come from their homes or wherever and there's like a boar or a bear or something that broke in and raided their fridge, but more often than not, those people survive and don't experience such a thing again. At worst, they fix their doors, maybe get a weapon for it, and usually, that is that. They live the rest of their lives in peace. I don't really blame an animal for wanting food, but generally, you aren't going to see a bear wandering around in winter. So I'm a bit perplexed in some manner as to what was big enough to mess up my previous door. I don't dwell on this though, cause it might just freak me out. I just continue to play with Benjamin for the rest of the day. We head back in that evening on account of the fact that it's supposed to snow again and tonight a winter storm is supposed to be here, and probably will be here for the next week or so. I figure that'll mean a lot of shoveling on my part, but... I'm more than prepared for winter out here seeing as I've been out here for most of my life. It's hard to believe I used to dwell more in the city when I was younger. I eventually got tired of that in society and decided to move out here around 25. Now I'm 45 and well versed in living in the wilderness. My only regret is that I didn't take to doing this sooner. Life is peaceful out here, for the most part, I think to myself. It's quite nice and... You'll never have any real problems with people here. Walking inside my cabin, I lock up and barricade my door before making some dinner for myself and feeding Benjamin as well. I stay up after doing dishes and watching some television before finally turning out the lights around 10 and heading to bed. Thump. 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 Benjamin, I think we have a guest again. What do you say we greet him? Benjamin shoots up already on edge from the thumping at the door as I grab my rifle and head out towards the living room. I still don't see anything through my windows and so I look out my peephole. It's dark and there doesn't appear to be anything there. As soon as I said that, I saw a large eye that took me by surprise. 
and made me jump back for a minute. This was followed by another loud and persistent thumping on my door. Once I got over the initial surprise, I pounded back on my door, rifle in hand, and getting tired of being awoken in the middle of the night. I addressed whatever animal was out there. Listen here. I am tired and cranky, and I am sick of waking up in the middle of the night. You can bang all you want, but you won't be getting through my door. There was a silence for a moment, and Benjamin was on edge as he waited to hear something back. After a few minutes, we thought maybe we'd scared the thing off. Still, to be safe, I waited for another hour. Nothing. Finally, we went back to bed and I passed out again. I shot up and ran for the door at the sound of a smashing and truck alarm blaring. I looked out the window, but couldn't see well through the snow. A few seconds go by when I suddenly see my truck flying towards the side of my cabin. I fell back before the truck impacted the side of the cabin. The cabin shook and Benjamin barked like mad as I scrambled to my feet and saw pieces of glass from my windows on the floor now. Holding up my rifle, I looked through the scope and saw nothing. I wanted to go out, but decided it was for the best not to. Whatever had destroyed my truck threw it with enough force that it hit the side of my cabin. I'd never encountered any sort of animal that could do such a thing. Based on the eye that I saw, I'd say whatever was out there couldn't be human at all. I quickly pulled out my phone and began dialing the cops. I was on the line when I heard a loud howling of some kind. The dispatch asked where I lived and what was happening and all I could muster up was the courage to say to get over here, giving them my address along with that message, before hanging up. It took a few hours, but soon the sheriff arrived and knocked on my door. He asked what in the how had happened and I explained to him everything from the past few nights leading up to this moment. Perplexed, he had looked around and told me to stay put. I waited, rifle in hand for his return. After a half hour or so, he returned and informed me that he wasn't sure what the hell was going on, but he'd take a report and come back in the morning when he could see better to check things out. He informed me that I should lock and barricade my door and if I hear anything else out of the ordinary to call him. He then handed me a card with his number on it and soon after left. I didn't sleep the remainder of the night, but I also never heard anything else outside either. Morning finally came, and true to his word the sheriff returned and we both looked around the place more thoroughly. It was snowing like crazy and we didn't really find much. The sheriff reassured me, saying it's likely the snow covered up any tracks that was made and that I should think about putting up some sort of security system or maybe some cameras that snap pictures at the first sight of movement. I agreed and soon after departed from the cabin. I spent the rest of the day making calls to my insurance company and arguing about how I had no clue what destroyed my truck. I also made some repairs at the side of my cabin, and after having my truck towed away, I soon pulled my four-wheeler out of the shed and headed to get some cameras. By the time I returned, the night was coming fast, so I installed and tested my cameras before having Benjamin go to the bathroom, and then I locked up my ATV in my shed and went inside my cabin. I made dinner and tried to relax as best as I could, but I was quite shaken from the previous night's events. I kept my rifle close to me at all times because now I was occasionally picking up my peephole. I saw nothing and I barricaded my windows at this point in an attempt to keep the snow out. The night was long and very little sound had me up, checking my door every time. I was tired but I couldn't bring myself to sleep just yet. I was sure whatever was out there would be back. If not tonight, tomorrow night. If not then, at some point down the road for sure. Sure as shit, I started to doze off when I heard a loud thumping at my door. I got up and slammed back once again. Go away! If you don't, I'll shoot you myself! There was a howling, followed by an even louder thud as I felt my floor shake. I held my rifle up at the door and waited as I heard two more thuds. This was followed by a loud howling before everything went silent again. The thought crossed my mind to call the sheriff again, but as things had fallen silent, I decided not to. I was scared for sure, but the thing had been able to get through my door yet, so I didn't feel like I needed to call him immediately. I wasn't in immediate danger just yet as long as that store stayed strong. It was about four in the morning, and so I made some coffee and waited for Benjamin for daylight to come. 
Once the sun crested over the mountains, and it was bright enough, I unlocked my door and headed out with Benjamin to check out my door, also the cameras. The door seemed well, aside from an indentation. The frame seemed undamaged, and as such, I decided to immediately check the cameras next. Looking over the film, I was distraught. Th there were photos of something big. It looked about nine feet tall. It had been throwing its shoulder into my door before leaving last night. I was in shock at the sight of this creature as it stood on two legs. But, but my cameras didn't get a good enough picture of it to tell what it really was. Walking in the direction of the creature, I, I tried to follow the tracks, but I was at a loss. So it would, uh, I decided to head back to town on my four-wheeler and pick up some more cameras for the cabin itself. And soon after returned, setting them up in places where I would get a much better view of the thing if I returned. After installing the cameras, I worked on the repair to the side of my cabin some more. It was coming along slowly, but it was definitely coming along well. Once again, night came. Benjamin and I headed inside, and I made some dinner for us both. After locking and barricading the door behind me, I hoped tonight, by some miracle of God himself, I'd hopefully get some real rest. To my surprise, I did just that. After heading to bed, I didn't hear a sound outside except for the snow. Once morning came, I felt refreshed and a little bit better. I received a call from the sheriff who I informed I was okay still, before explaining I had done, as he said with the cameras. I told him I caught something I didn't know how to explain on my cameras before having him over and showing him the photos myself. The sheriff suggested something odd to me. He said he didn't normally jump to such far-fetched conclusions, but he thought there was a chance it could be a Bigfoot. I laughed at the sheriff at first before I noticed he wasn't laughing at all. You can't be serious, right sheriff? The sheriff nodded at me, quite seriously before telling me he'd seen some strange things in his time, and out in the woods of Washington, he'd investigated other claims of strange happenings in his long career. He said they'd gone unexplained, but he'd seen tracks before and he was convinced Bigfoot existed. I wanted to laugh, but I didn't this time. Well, what the hell am I supposed to do about this if you are right, Sheriff? He shook his head, unsure of what to say before putting his hand on my shoulders and telling me to install those other cameras, double check my locks and reinforcements, and keep my gun close just in case. He left me with the words. If this thing is aggressive as it seems, I'd need all the help I could get. He offered to stick around for the night, and I almost declined before thinking I'd be better safe rather than sorry, right? The next couple of nights went by quickly. I slept, and not a thing had happened. It didn't return. It was nearing the end of the week, and the snow was finally beginning to let up, and when I shook the sheriff's hand and told him thank you before he finally went on his own way, he said if anything happened again, feel free to call him, and he'd head this way. We'd work on the cabin over the past couple of days, and had just about fully repaired the side, and we almost replaced the windows. I was feeling slightly more relaxed as I hadn't seen the creature in about three nights or so. That relaxation lasted as long as it took me to check the cameras. It seemed the last few nights, the sheriff and I had not been alone as we believed ourselves to be. On the cameras, I saw the thing still not very clearly several times. In some of the photos, it simply sat and waited, observing the cabin. In others, it looked inside the windows of the sheriff's vehicle before slinking back into the trees, waiting. At one point, a time for which I'm sure we're both still awake and talking, you could see the creature listening in, its ears pressed to the door. I never got a completely clear shot, however and so I didn't have definitive proof of what it looked like. My first thought was to call the sheriff back, but upon further reflection, I decided against it. This thing was intelligent. It was waiting for me to be alone again. It knew I wasn't, so it didn't attack any of those nights. If I was going to lure it out again, and at the very least get a better shot of it, I need to stay alone until it came out to see me. So that's what I did. I made a real meal, and soon hit the bed early. I waited quietly, 
hoping to hear the thing again. I had locked my door and barricaded my camera. I made sure it was running. I was prepared to find proof of the thing that stalked me. I had a feeling I'd do just that. With enough patience at some point late in the night, I must have drifted off because before I knew it, the morning was upon me again. Waking up, I went to the kitchen to make breakfast and noticed it was still snowing. I checked the weather which seemed to indicate there was another system that had developed overnight and had heavier snowfall, and that we would be stuck here in the snow longer than anticipated. Thinking nothing of this, I ate breakfast and headed out to check the cameras with Benjamin happily running alongside me. It was only now I realized a problem. The cameras were no longer there. I found them destroyed, all over the yard. Any film I recovered only showed black or nothing on it at all but snow. It was almost as if this thing had spotted the cameras, avoided them, and soon after destroyed them one by one, leaving the husk of the cameras behind as a message. That's not what happened though, right? I mean, there's no way that Bigfoot or whatever the hell this thing is was that intelligent, right? I tried to shake off the thought before going inside and calling the sheriff. It didn't take long for him to arrive and we discussed what had happened. I'm at a loss, Sheriff. I'm not sure what to do now. If I get more cameras, this thing might just destroy them again. I mean, I don't know if it can climb or what it can do or what it's capable of or what it's not incapable of. If I have you or anyone stay nearby, it likely won't show up again. You can't stick around forever though. What do you think? The sheriff seemed every bit of miss at a loss as I was. He was confused and unsure of what to try next, but he agreed. Getting another camera would likely be a waste of money. Perplexed by the intelligence of this thing, the sheriff said to call him if I noticed anything else odd or if the thing attacked again. Soon after, he drove away, looking every bit as confused as I felt. What was I going to do? There was no way I could simply ignore this thing. There was no way I could do anything to catch it in the act. I had never felt so hopeless in my entire life as I did at this point in time. Deciding not to get too down on myself, as it wouldn't help my situation anyways, I went about my day shoveling snow and chopping some firewood before ending the day playing with Benjamin and trying to stay relaxed. I knew panicking wasn't going to help me or anything, and at this point, I eat all my wits about me every night until this was over. Locking things up, I ate some dinner and spent the rest of the night watching some movies and trying to relax as much as possible. To my surprise, I awoke to find it was 9 in the morning. I'd awoken much later than usual and found Benjamin licking me and trying to get me outside probably so he could go to the bathroom. I got up and let Benjamin do his business before looking around the property. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until I checked my shed. The lock had been broken off and my four-wheeler was missing. Shit, I thought to myself. This thing wanted me stranded completely. I wasn't too worried. I had plenty of food to make it through the winter. But the thought that I was stranded did leave me with some sense of unease. I searched for my vehicle for quite some time before finally finding it an hour away wrapped around a tree, down a steep drop-off, heading back home. I called the sheriff and explained to him what had happened. I insisted he didn't stick around, however, as the only way this Bigfoot was going to show itself, if that even what it was, was if I was alone. With no more than my dog. He said he wouldn't stay, but I need to show him where my four-wheeler was found. So I did, and the remainder of my day was spent with him examining the damage and making a report before leaving. This was insane, I thought to myself, when I finally settled in for the night at my cabin. I had an uneasy feeling as I went to bed. Something didn't feel right about tonight. It wasn't just that this thing was slowly making moves to isolate me. It was also that it seemed to know I had nowhere else to go. It was though it had chosen me off of the basis that it knew I didn't have anyone else to stay with or live with. How long had this thing been watching me? Had it been days, weeks, months? I hesitated to think the last part, but had it been years? Whatever the case may be, it knew exactly when to come out so it wouldn't be seen. It was highly intelligent and I was out of options other than to wait for it to try to enter my home again and deal with it accordingly. I pondered what I'd do if that happened until, finally, 
I drifted off to sleep. Thump. 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 The banging was louder than ever, and I shot up out of bed. Running for my phone, I immediately called the sheriff. The phone rang as I did. I could see the steel bending on my barricade. H Hello? Sawyer? Are, are you there, Sawyer? Sawyer, is, is that your dog? Sawyer? So. Update. It was in half an hour or so before I arrived at the cabin. There was blood in the sight of a mangled steel door on the floor. Looking around, I noticed the foam was ripped out of the wall and in pieces. Walking further into the cabin, the lights were dead and it was in the back room. Amongst other destroyed doors, I found Sawyer, gun clutched to his chest terrified. It took a bit of persuasion, but I finally got Sawyer to hand me the gun and I soon called up the crime scene and brought him down to the station. After giving him some cocoa and giving him some time to come down from the shock, he explained to me that he awoke to the sound of violent banging. He then explained how he tried to call me, but as soon as he dialed, his door was beginning to give away, so he headed for it. After much struggling, he backed off when he realized the door was going to fall. He didn't want to be crushed by it, so as soon as the thing entered his home, his dog Benjamin jumped at it, and a bit at it before being thrown off, getting up and barking again. He said he emptied every bullet he had into the thing as it ripped the phone out of the wall and crushed it. I stopped Sawyer and asked if he killed the thing. He said he grabbed the gun. He had his back up in his case and emptied every shell he could into it, but it only howled, turned away, and ran off into the night. Sawyer seemed quite convinced the soccer was alive and well. We staged a few more stakeouts and I left him alone, per his wishes, for several nights after. Nights turned into weeks, which turned into months, and there was never a word or another harassment from this thing again. Sawyer and I became friends, bonded by our involvement in this case. He still says he has PTSD to this day from the events. But since repaired his cabin, completely lives alone and in the same spot. Although he fears his attacker, he refuses to move. We are still friends to this day, to this day, to this day. The night is late, and I'm growing weary. The past few weeks I've heard howling in the late night hours. I've watched as livestock goes missing or is found torn open. There are rumors spreading and fear that is growing among townsfolk. So I walk now, hunting, searching for whatever is doing the killing. Now, however, the matter is of more important sort. You see, last night we found little Beth Sanders with her face eaten off, her body torn open and in the middle of a street. The poor girl was just taking out the trash when she was attacked. The parents came running naturally, but they said in the few seconds it took to hear her screams and the howling, they'd open the front door in time to see their little girl screaming and being dragged into the darkness. She was only 11 years old, and the fear in the eye she had left said it all. My name is Job Anderson. I'm a local hunter here in Michigan. I volunteered to hunt this monster that killed Beth and many of the livestock around these parts. In my search for this thing, I found evidence that suggests that it lives in the woods. I imagine Beth was only partially devoured because of all the ruckus from the town when she went screaming into the darkness. This is all speculation, but since this thing started harassing the town, our livestock numbers have drastically dwindled. I don't know if it attacked Beth because she happened to be there or it did so out of necessity for food, but it was vicious. 
Local authorities are keeping an eye out on things tonight as well, but none of them have come out to join my hunt, just yet. Walking the path where Beth was dragged and ultimately found, I could still see bits of blood in the street that eventually lead off towards the woods. The further I head in, however, the less evidence I find of any sort of animal at all. I spend an hour out here before I finally find some prints in the snow. They look like a dog or a wolf's foot, but they appear to be headed back into town, and they look fresh. That's when I hear the sound of gunfire and screaming in the distance. Quickly, I turn around and head back to town. By the time I reach the town, however, there's blood all over the street and sheriff's vehicles abandoned in the roadways. Quickly, I follow the trail of blood into the darkened alleys of a small town. It isn't long before I came upon the body of an already dead sheriff, their insides ripped open and torn through. It was Sheriff Williams, a man who'd been with the sheriff's office for 22 years. His body was ripped in half, a look of horror on his dead face. Jesus, I thought to myself, what the heck could have done this? Gunfire rang out farther ahead and I rushed forward until I heard a growling, then a howling, followed by a woman's screams. I arrived in time to see blood, which went up to a bank, before going up and headed back down into the main street to find bodies everywhere. Gun shells were just as numerous. There was blood and organs all over the street. There were women and men in sheriff's uniforms, strewn everywhere. I was in shock and terror at this point, as I gazed at the side of one of the vehicles and saw bloody claw marks torn into the side of the vehicle. What the hell had done this, and why? I thought to myself. It didn't make any sense. First, it was livestock, but now, it seemed like it was hunting people. Whatever it was, he had a thirst for carnage. These past weeks have been terrifying, but this was on a whole new level. The sheriff's office was all we had around here. We weren't a big town. There was no reason for any other sort of law enforcement, and most everyday police in towns are a ways away. It seems now, however, that our law enforcement might be gone for good. I heard a door open, and Richard, one of the locals, came out asking me the only question that made sense. What the hell happened? Those were the words he spoke, and I didn't really have much of an answer. I informed him to go inside, half in a state of shock myself, as I said this. I then stood and waited. It was quiet for the next few hours, and I imagine most of the folks were afraid to leave their homes. I couldn't blame them either. I waited till the sun rose again before going around, door to door trying to get everyone to meet at the local church. Something needed to be done, and it seemed we were alone now in trying to take care of the situation. I would need help, and there was no way I felt comfortable taking this damn thing on alone. Once we had the locals in the church, I had Jimmy lock and bar all the doors. This was unsettling to the town folk, but I needed their attention, and I didn't want to chance that thing trying to come for us. I motioned for everyone to quiet down, then I addressed them all as best as I could. Listen up, folks. I understand y'all are scared, and rightfully so. I understand you have a lot of questions, and I simply do not have most of those answers. Before we get too deep into this conversation, I want to get something out of the way. First, we are going to need all the women with children to leave the town before tonight. Pack light and keep your phones close. We will inform you when it's safe to return. A large uproar rang out, but once it died down, I continued speaking. If you're a woman, you have no child, and you have the ability to hunt, I'd like you to join me. The same goes for any and every man with a gun who is capable and willing to help me hunt this bastard down. I'm not sure what's out there, but it's very capable of killing. It started small and with our livestock, but quickly turned to our townsfolk. I believe the entire sheriff department is dead, so that makes us the only defense for our town. There was a hushed silence now as I continued to speak. I won't force you to join me in my hunt, but I'd like you to join me if you can. We need to end the threat to this town, right freaking now. 
If you are afraid or would rather join your families, I fully understand. I do urge you, however, to think about your town. Those who have already fallen and the possibility that this thing could go and terrorize other families in other towns. Think long and hard on that before making your decision. But, those willing to stay and hunt with me, please remain here in the church. The rest of you, I wish you safe travels, and I pray that you can have a safe return soon. There was more silence as we unlocked and unbarred the doors. A few minutes went by before most of the women and children went home loaded up their stuff and began leaving the town. Ultimately, there remained nine of us in the church. Seven men and two women. That was all that would be staying behind. I didn't blame those that left and I thought this would probably be a good thing, as there would be fewer fatalities this way. I didn't waste any time before speaking to the remaining group. Alright, listen up. First, I'd like to say thank you to all of you. I know a lot is happening fast, but we need to keep our focus. We have to kill whatever the hell is out there murdering us. I'm thinking we stock up on ammunition and weapons from a local gun shop in the sheriff's office to bolster what we already have between us. Next, we need to take what's left of our livestock and use it as bait. I'd like to strategically place it, so the thing has to move in a specific direction, leading it to the old bank. We can split up into two teams of four at that point and wait for the thing. The moment you see it coming for the livestock, you have a shot. Fire on it. I'm hoping we can kill it in an ambush, but be wary. This thing killed our entire sheriff's department. They had plenty of ammunition. If this thing somehow makes it to the bank, I'll have something rigged to hopefully end the thing once and for all. We'll communicate via walkie-talkie, one for each of us. Stay safe out there, my friends, and we'll begin dividing teams now. Jack, Jimmy, Leanne, and August will make team one. Y'all will wait up by the farm for the initial assault. Once the beast nestles into feeding on livestock, fire upon it. Only do so from hidden stands near the woods. You should be able to see the farm with the scope from your rifles. Once you've got the beast's attention, let out a deer call and team two will come out with a distraction. Team two will consist of Thomas, Darnell, Bob, and Nathan. As soon as you hear the signal, I want y'all to turn on the sirens in a couple of the sheriff trucks you'll be waiting in, halfway between the farm and the post office. I'll make sure to keep a good distance from the thing once it gives us a chase. I want you to lead the beast into town and near the bank where I'll have the trap waiting. As soon as you hit the street, just past the bank, I want you to shut off your sirens and lights and veer off into the opposite directions down the street. You're to circle back up and pick up Team 1 and regroup at the church till further notice. Everyone seemed to understand the instruction given, but there were a few questions about what I was planning to do once the creature reached the bank. I informed them I'd have a few barrels of flammable and explosive material waiting in the center of the street, outside the bank. Once the creature got close by chasing Team 2, I'd fire around into the barrels and hopefully light the monster up like Christmas. After explaining all of this, everyone spent the rest of the day prepping to take this thing down. I wasn't sure if this would work, but it was the best plan I had at the moment. In truth, I was hoping phase one of the plan would be enough to take the beast down, but only time would tell. It did take long for night to fall upon us again. I was exhausted and weary from not sleeping the night prior. I waited on the top floor of the bank, reflecting on what had happened the night before. I pondered what I would do if this plan failed what I would do if anyone died as a result of it. I planned on killing this thing one way or the other, so I suppose if the plan falls through, I probably would be alive to worry about the end result. It was about 10 when I heard the sound of gunfire in the distance. Team 1 had made contact, and after a minute or so, we heard the deer call over the radio. Sirens rang out as I heard Team 2's police SUVs heading in my direction. I checked in with Team 1, who said they were waiting for Team 2 to circle around when I heard a loud screaming over the radio. There was gunfire, and this was soon followed by the sight of the sheriff's SUV running straight into the barrels I laid out. There was a loud explosion and fire roared as I heard another SUV crash. There's no way, I thought. I quickly fired around to distract the beast while I rushed downstairs and tried to get into the street. To my horror... I saw a creature with eyes that looked red in the darkness. 
It was quite tall, and stood on two legs. It was quite muscular, but still slim and had a dog's head. It couldn't be, I thought to myself. And the creature's teeth was Bob. He looked mortified as the thing's teeth sank into his stomach and ripped him in half. There was blood, and there was screams as the thing devoured most of Bob in seconds. Thomas kicked out the door of his SUV screaming and on fire from the explosive barrels. He was panicking and talking about how Darnell was dead before falling over and continuing to burn. I moved to help him, but it was clear it was already too late. I fired a few shots from my rifle off into the beast, but it only seemed to piss the thing off. I quickly ran into and locked the bank down. I soon barricaded myself as I heard a loud growling and felt the beast trying to break inside. Then I heard the sound of more gunfire. That could only be Nathan, I thought to myself. I quickly jumped onto the radio and told Nathan to get the hell out of there and get back to the church. I'd handle this thing on my own, or I'd die trying. I didn't want any more blood on my hands. I'm not sure what went wrong, but I'm guessing this thing caught up to the SUV at some point. I quickly ran upstairs and looked at all I had. I then heard a loud howl, followed by the sound of screaming. Looking out the window, I saw Nathan crawling across the road, missing a leg. This beast quickly finished him by burying its teeth into its spine and ripping it from his body in one quick bite. I was in shock and horrified at how quickly everything went wrong. I fired a few more shots at the beast while leaning out the window. There was a growling and a loud howl before I saw it run off. Silence fell over the town for a moment until finally, my walkie-talkie crackled to life. Ja Jack was on the other line. This is on you, is all he said, before going silent. I didn't argue. I couldn't possibly argue. He was right. It was completely on me. An hour went by in silence before I decided it might be safe to go back to the church. Once I arrived, with the guns and ammunition I had left on hand, I shut the place down and barricaded it. Sullenly, I walked towards Jack, Jimmy, Leanne, and August, and apologized to them before heading into the pastor's office and getting some sleep. No one confronted me about it after that. I awoke the next morning to find Jack gone. Jimmy informed me Jack decided to leave town. I couldn't blame him. After hearing what he heard, that being said, I'd seen it and there was no way I could let something like that live. I looked around at Jimmy, Leanne, and August. The mood was heavy in the room, but I informed them if they felt like going, they could as well. Jimmy put a hand on my shoulder and laughed. He spoke about how he'd lived here his whole life. He was raised here and he wasn't going to give up his home so easily. Leanne and August seemed pretty set on sticking around as well. It was nice to have the support, but after last night, I had no plan. I wasn't sure how I was going to kill this thing or have a chance at all against it. What could we possibly do against a predator like that? I'd never seen anything so vicious or so terrifying in all of my life. Leanne could see I was in a complete haze when she suggested complete suicide. She said we should hunt the thing down in the woods, take the fight to its home. I laughed at this. I was probably losing it to some degree, but I wasn't that crazy just yet. You got a plan to go with that suggestion? Leanne shot me a look that pretty much said I was being an asshole. She wasn't wrong either. I didn't want any more blood on my hands. I tried a plan. I thought it was a good plan, and was well executed, except it wasn't, and it failed. We lost four people to my foolish underestimation of this creature. I'm sorry for being a dick, Leanne. Here's the thing though. You didn't watch Bob's horrified expression as he was ripped in two and devoured in seconds. Jack was right. That's on me. You didn't see Nathan crawling for dear life across the street before having his spine ripped up from his body. It's all on me. I underestimated this thing and failed us. I felt Jimmy's hand on my shoulder again. He told me it was okay. He said at least I had a plan at the time. He reminded me how everyone who stayed behind had volunteered of their own volition and for the love they had for their hometown. I couldn't believe it. In some ways, I almost swore Jimmy was naive or insane to want to stay here and fight the thing. Then again, some part of his faith and confidence helped me recollect myself. 
I let out a huge sigh and began thinking. Well, if we're going to do this, we'll need all the guns we can carry. I shot that thing and I'm sure I hit it more than once. It had only seemed to piss it off. We also need food and supplies in case we're out there for a while. Let's eat, we'll load up, and head out as soon as possible. I don't know if this thing comes out during the day, but I'd like to get a head start before it's dark out. It was with that we ate, packed all the guns and ammunition we could, stand the carry, along with some supplies, and we headed for the woods themselves. I was pretty sure this was suicide. I thought it was likely that we'd never be heard from again, and whatever happened at the town would be a mystery to the world. Maybe it would end like that. Regardless, I felt we had no choice, but to push forward, even if it meant we died. Hopefully, we'd kill the hellish beast in the process. We set off and much of the day was spent looking for any sign of the beast. It was cold out and the woods were quiet. Some part of me wished we never found the beast, and it simply never returned to town again. Maybe it'd be wiser if we all just abandoned town, but then, the sensible half, if you want to call it that of me, said this thing needed to die. It'd just come back and torment anyone who might live in the town again or even those in neighboring towns. It wasn't long before I heard Leanne call from ahead, the group to rejoin her. Upon our arrival, we found a deer, laying there in pieces. It was mostly just the head and a leg or two that remained. There was also a piece of the organs and a ton of blood in the area. Looking further, we found dried and bloody claw marks. The beast had been there for sure. How long ago was hard to tell, but it wasn't immediately recent. There were some tracks in the ground and a trail of blood, but all these things faded over time. It wasn't long before night fell upon us and we decided to camp out, but keep a watch. The first watch would consist of August and Jimmy, while the second watch would consist of myself and Leanne. Exhausted from the stress and trek through the woods, I passed out quickly. I'm not sure what time it is now, but I've awoken to the sound of gunshots and screaming. Upon leaving the tent, I see Leanne, gun in the air, shaking. She tells me she fired upon the monstrosity. She mentioned how the thing came from the darkness and grabbed Jimmy before he could react. Even now, we can still hear his screams. Leanne starts to run forwards, but I tell her to wait. We need to travel together. It's not much safer, but it's the safest we'll be hunting this thing. August and Leanne nod in agreement, and we grab our gear and rush in the direction of Jimmy's screams. As we get closer, his screams get more agonizing. I'm beginning to wonder if the thing is using him to lead us deeper into the woods. It almost seems sadistic at times in its methods. I put the thought out of mind as we pick up speed and push through the trees and brush. The minutes grow longer and the night grows colder. The longer we get pursuit, the more I feel like we're already too late. I try not to give in to such thoughts, but it's becoming harder not to now. Everyone keeps dying, I think to myself. Just as I began to shake myself from the mindset, we came upon a clearing. Jimmy is coughing up blood. He's been torn open and is trying to say something through gurgled breath. I lean in closer, and as I do, I hear him say, it's a trap. And I look up and shout to be ready, but as I do, I hear a crunch from behind us. Turning around, there's a stump where August's head used to be. A geyser of blood is spouting from it. Standing before us is a monstrosity, and seeing it in full view now, I realize what it is. I couldn't be 100% sure in the shadows from before, but now I was positive. Th this, this was the Dogman of Michigan. Part of me didn't want to believe it, but it matched the description of the legends and other sightings to the slightest detail. I was left in shock and dismay before I'd recollected myself and fired at the beast. It howled out before crunching August's head, completely between its teeth, and darting in my direction. I fired off another round, and saw the bullets entered the beast which knocked me off my feet and into a tree. The beast is on me before I even fully hit the ground, but then lets out an angry howl as it feels buckshot in its head. Turning, it leaps on a shocked Leanne who stabs it in the face a few times, while I scrambled up and fire a few more times on the beast myself. 
It quickly grabs Leanne and hurls her at me. I feel Leanne hit me, and then both of us hit a tree, but upon looking up, I notice the beast is gone. Uh, are you okay, Leanne? She nods in pain as we both slowly stand up. I look around, shaking in fear as I reload my shotgun and walk in the direction I saw the dogman run. I can't believe this thing is real. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I'd never believed it was real. It killed so many of my friends and destroyed so much of my hometown. The thing needed to die. The rest of the night we spent trying to pursue our prey, but we never found it. By daybreak, we tired and wanted to sleep, but to sleep probably meant death at this point. Stopping, we decided to eat and keep watch together. Watching her closely, I could tell Leanne was having the same thoughts I was about this whole situation. Maybe we shouldn't have kept pursuing the dogman. Maybe we should turn and head home. You can go home, or leave completely if you need to. Leanne looked at me with a look that suggested she was half thinking about it before thinking and shaking her head no, and telling me we needed to kill this thing. Yep. We both stood up and put the fire out at our makeshift camp, before continuing our search of signs for the nemesis in the woods. Eventually, we did find something. Claw marks in the trees that seemed to lead straight ahead. Wary, it could be another trap. I told Leanne to be careful as we proceeded. Eventually, we reached a cave. Could this be it? Could this be the beast lair? Slowly I approached, motioning for Leanne to wait, but to be ready. Stepping inside the cave, I see bones everywhere. Some were animals, others appeared to be human in form. Moving deeper, I found an empty dead end. There were still bones, so perhaps this was the thing's lair. But if it was, it was it wasn't here presently. The sound of gunfire rang out behind me as I heard Leanne cussing at something and calling out my name. I rushed out to see nothing, but Leanne. What, what'd you see? She informed me she saw the beast, but it quickly darted away when she fired at it. Realizing we were in the right place, I told Leanne that we should move away and wait until nightfall. So, the remainder of the day we waited and prepared. I thought to myself about how things would end. They needed to end tonight. We were running low on supplies and I was not quite sure if this dogman was going to let us just waltz out of the woods and go back to town to resupply. Hell, at this point the town could be in the news already. If anyone passed through it, got a sight of the devastation, they'd likely have called someone. Maybe we should have done that ourselves, but I didn't want any more dead on my conscience. The sun began to set and as it did, I looked at Leanne closely. She didn't need to die, I thought to myself as I twirled something in my coat pocket. I then stood up, loaded my gun and headed in the direction of the cave. I could hear Leanne asking me where I was going, but I kept walking. It was sunset when I approached the cave. I fired a few shots inside to get the attention of the creature. It didn't take long for the glowing red eyes to appear and soon after the beast stood before me growling. You die tonight, you son of a bitch. I charged forward, firing every bullet I had in my shotgun. The thing was angry and was about to jump on me when I heard a bullet whiz by and strike it. Leave, Leanne, go now! She kept firing and the dogman howled before rushing her. I gave chase, pulled out my knife and leaped on the creature's back, stabbing it several times and felt the monster howl as a few more shots landed in the beast from Leanne. Leave, Leanne, I'm going to end this! I said as I pulled out and waved a stick of dynamite. I had kept as long as a last ditch effort. I didn't see Leanne's expression, but I did hear her shouting something to the effect of Mike being crazy. There may have been something about not doing it, but I didn't hear it as I stabbed again and again into the backside of the creature until I was thrown off and sure I had its attention. I lost my knife, but I still had my lighter as I slowly backed into the cave and lit the stick of dynamite. I watched as the creature rushed towards me. I still couldn't believe it, or any of this was real. I could feel the creature bury its teeth into me. I could feel the life draining from my body. I felt the warmth of my own blood and found it to be oddly relaxing. Then everything disappeared in a loud bang and bright flash of light. The cave had collapsed that night. 
shortly after the explosion. I wasn't sure if the monster we fought was really dead, but as I arrived back in the town, the news crews were already there. Search parties had apparently been sent out to find us. There were many questions to which I wasn't sure how to answer. The town is back to normal. Most of the town folk moved back in. We haven't seen anything strange since. I'm not sure if that thing is dead or if there are more of them out there. But some nights I could still hear a howling in the distance on nights like that. And I don't sleep those nights. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright unexplainable stories. I hope you enjoyed them, and I hope you have some great, sweet nightmares tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, please hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this video gets, the more YouTube promotes it to fresh new eyes, and that helps me out a ton. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new video as I upload them almost every single day, and all things natural, and supernatural. Much thanks to my friend Vidif22 who helped me read some of these stories today. If you enjoyed them, please be sure to check out his link at the top of the description and subscribe to his channel. He is very close to 10,000 subscribers, and that'd be awesome to see him hit that. You guys can download your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and pretty much everywhere else you listen to podcasts online. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the swamp the way you do. Thank you for all the well wishes and being so concerned about my health. It really does make me feel great. I'll see you guys soon with another creepy video.